So good afternoon and thanks for um, saying hello in the comments box. Um, while we're just um, do doing a, a final check on the technology and making sure that everybody's here, drop a little note in the chat box to say who you are and where you're from and what your level of GDPR knowledge is. Are you, is it completely new to you? Have you never even heard of it before? Um, or have you really taken an interest in it and read up on it and you're pretty much an expert or you're somewhere in the middle? Um, let's pop that in the chat box so that we can get a little bit of a view as to where you're up to with your GDPR knowledge. Lovely. Well, thanks for that. We've got Brent saying, Brent from the Netherlands. Lovely. Uh, no knowledge. OK, great. Well, I'm here to help. Uh, ben in the middle. Andrew in the middle. Uh, oh, you're all coming in too quickly. I can't read that. Uh, no knowledge, some knowledge. Uh, hello from France. Hello from a snowy Morecambe. Uh, excellent. Okay, keep it coming in. That's really good to know. Um, uh, Sharon says aware of some of it, but it's confusing. Well, Sharon, it doesn't have to be confusing. Um, that's my message to people. It doesn't need to be confusing. I think there's a lot of hype about it. I think there's a lot of incorrect advice that you can find online. And actually, if you distill it down to its basics, it's actually not that confusing. So um, we're going to have some fun on this webinar. I always smile when I say fun because people really don't think of law as fun, but um, but we're gonna make it fun today. And I'm going to show you that GDPR doesn't have to be a nightmare. It can actually be a really positive thing for your business. Uh, so um, let's, uh, let's, I'm just doing a final tech check and then we'll get, we will get uh, into the content. So Dara's saying she can't hear anything. Um, I'm guessing that the fact that you're all replying to my question about what knowledge you have means that the vast majority of you can hear me. Um, so I suspect it's at your end, Dara. Uh, so I hope you resolve that. Wonderful. OK, so there's a real mix of knowledge here today from the don't know anything through to the uh, you're writing articles on it. So so that's super. OK, but the good thing is, is that you're all interested in it. That's why you're here, um, which I have to say, as a lawyer, is um, mu it's music to my ears because it's not often that, that legislation invokes this response that we're seeing to GDPR. So um, I'm delighted that you're here. OK, wonderful. So we're going to be going for about two hours. So what I would advise you to do, because although I try to make it as simple as possible, we are still dealing with quite complex um, legislation and complex thoughts and, and I'll be breaking it down into very simple chunks and, and giving you some real actionable steps that you can take but you don't want to be multitasking you may as well not bother coming onto this training if you're going to be you know trying to do your um, your you know looking at Facebook or trying to get some work done or whatever it might be so let's clear off all of those distractions and uh, get yourself a paper and a pen and some water or a cup of tea, whatever takes your fancy, probably nothing too, uh, nothing too, uh, too, too heavy at this time of day and, and with this content, but something to keep you well hydrated. Um, Alex, yes, there will be a replay to this. Um, everyone who's registered will get the replay. So um, that will be winging its way to you, hopefully automatically after we've finished. Okay, so um, <laughs> Mel says the toddler won't go away. Sorry, going to have to multitask. Yes, that is, I think toddlers are a, um, a, an exception to that rule. Um, Favourite, is it, is it okay to stick them in front of the iPad for a couple of hours? Is that, is that allowed? You know, I'm not too sure, but, um, but let's, let's try and minimise those distractions as much as we can. Now, I'm going to very much be, I want this to be an interactive session. I don't want to be here talking to you for two hours. Uh, my, my voice will start to give up and it will be very boring for you guys. So I'm going to ask you questions from time to time. I'd love you to be as interactive as you're being right now. And um, please do when, you know, something occurs to you, pop it in the chat box. Now, I'll be keeping a, an eye on the chat box to answer your questions, but I'm not going to, A, I'm not going to answer them all because we probably won't have the time because there's, you know, there's over 500 people registered for, uh, for, for this uh, session. 
and um, and and B, if they're very specific questions, they won't necessarily have application for the rest of the people listening. Um, plus C, I might be covering it later on in my slides. So I will be keeping an eye on your questions as we go through. If I don't answer it immediately and I haven't answered it by the end of the session, then we will be having a separate Q&A session at the end where you can ask it again, okay? All right, super, I think that is all the admin. Um, Adam, Adam says, can't see video or hear audio, restricted mode. I think that's a problem at your end, unfortunately, um, because everybody else seems to be okay hearing me and seeing me. Okay, super, so I'm excited to get started. Now, let's just, as in all good presentations, we'll do a little slide. Um, let me just share my slide here. Uh, So hopefully you can now see my slides. Can you just pop a little yes or no in the chat box uh, to confirm that you can see those slides? That would be awesome. No, you can't see the slides. Okay, um, that's not good. Let me try and do that again. Uh, Okay, it's saying that it's sharing. You're saying you've got a black screen. Okay, can you see this, guys? Still a black screen? Yes, oh, oh, Kim's saying yes. Yes, 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 yes. A oh, few. good. Okay, starting to have a major panic then. Okay, good, you can see the slides, that is awesome. Okay, so here's what we're gonna be looking at today. Now, and actually, um, there's one thing that I've taken out of this because I realized that it was just going to go on for too long. So actually what we're not going to look at in any detail today is the penultimate bullet point there about data processing agreements. Now, if you're not, I should say, if you're not already in my, um, my GDPR Facebook group, please do go and join that uh, because I'm doing a video a day in there for you. And I will be doing a video or a Facebook live um, on data processing. Uh, so uh, we're not going to cover that in any depth today, but just, um, know that I'll be doing a separate training on that. Okay, so what we're gonna be really focusing on today is GDPR um, in the context of sales and marketing and particularly online sales and marketing. Um, we're gonna be looking at an overview of GDPR because you know, actually the, first, the very first training that I did on uh, GDPR was just about the differences uh, between the existing uh, data protection legislation and the changes that GDPR were going to be bringing in. But what has become clear to me from running my Facebook group for the last week and from talking to uh, small business owners is that actually a lot of people weren't really that clear on the whole data protection regime anyway. So I'm going to be really stripping it back to basics at the start to explain you know, the overview of, of data protection and really what it's designed to do and, and what is, you know, what are we talking about when we're talking about personal data? What are we talking about when we're talking about processing? Uh, so we're gonna, gonna get straight back to basics so that, that even those of you with no knowledge whatsoever will feel comfortable with all of this by the end of the training. We're gonna be looking at why it's important. And of course, I'll be talking you through the increased sanctions for non-compliance. Now, one thing I would say is that there's a lot of hype around GDPR with headlines like, if you're not compliant, you're going to be fined 20 million euros. Now, that is not my view at all. I take a very sensible approach to compliance, as does happily, certainly in the UK, our supervisory authority, uh, the Information Commissioner's Office, takes a sensible approach too, you'll be happy to know. Um, it is not like there is a big police force that is going to be going around on the 25th of May, and if you are not compliant to the letter, you're going to be fined 20 million pounds. It is not like that at all. But what the increased sanctions do is they signify the importance that the European Commission and indeed the UK are placing on data protection. The Economist said recently that data is now the, the world's most valuable asset. It's no longer oil, it's data. And this changing environment, changing culture, changing technology, um, it, it's all leading to increased protection for individuals as, insofar as their personal data is concerned. 
but I'll be talking you through what are those increased sanctions and giving you my view on what the uh, the supervisory authorities um, approach to sanctions and non-compliance is likely to be. We'll be looking at the legal grounds for processing data. Not much is new there, but as I say, I think it's really important for you to understand this uh, so that you, you can comply with GDPR and data protection going forwards. We'll be looking at a marketing and sales cycle uh, in the context of GDPR because I've had, you know, most of the questions in my Facebook group have been about, um, you know, questions related to sales and marketing, as you might expect with it being called um, a group for online entrepreneurs. Um, we'll be looking at the replacement of the right to notify the ICO with an accountability obligation. I'm not going to say any more about that now, but we'll come on to that. We'll look at the new and very much expanded rights of data subjects, which you as a business owner need to know about. We'll look at what you now need to include in your privacy policy. We're not going to look at data processing agreements, as I said, and then we're going to do a very broad brush view of what are your new obligations. And in that part of the training, I just want to give you just red flags so that you know um, to follow that up. And I'll be doing more trainings in the Facebook group on um, the, the further detail of your obligations. So for example, I did a video last night about your um, the, the, the obligation to record your data processing. And it only applies to certain organizations. I did a video on that last night and was clear about who would have to comply with that obligation. Uh, so we'll be picking that up in, in the Facebook group as well. But the, very much the thrust of this training is about the sales and marketing side of GDPR and the legal grounds of processing data. Is that all cool? Give me a yes, a big yes in massive capital letters if that is all cool. Awesome. Lots of yeses coming in. Excellent. Good. OK, let's get cracking. Now, before we do get stuck into the content, I just want to tell you a little bit about me, because I know um, from uh, a lot of you in the group and, and I scanned down the names that were registered for this training. I know a lot of you, but there's probably a fair few of you on here who this is the first that you've heard about me. And you're thinking, why on earth are you the expert in this? Well, let me tell you a little bit about me. So I am a qualified lawyer. Um, I have been practicing for 20 years. I know I don't look old enough, although actually the photo on the slide there is uh, from when I was working with Richard Branson. And that was probably about 15 years ago, maybe 10, 10 years ago, uh, certainly before kids um, and before all of the wrinkles and the lines that lack of sleep due to having kids causes. Um, so I've been doing it a very long time. And I started out um, training and practicing at the world's largest law firm. And, uh, and, and during that time, uh, actually as an M&A lawyer uh, doing mergers and acquisitions um, in the city, the kind of deals that you'd read about on, on the front page of the FT. But as part of that, I was seconded to Virgin, where to their head office, where I worked very closely with Richard Branson. And whilst I was there, I led a group wide data protection project for Virgin across all of their group companies. Uh, we went in, did a really in-depth analysis of how they were compliant, how they weren't, and put a remediation plan in place. And now as a result of that and other things that I did while I was there, Virgin actually nominated me for Solicitor of the Year Award, which in itself is pretty special. And um, the fact that I was then shortlisted, um, couldn't actually believe that. Um, but then the fact that I was actually runner up uh, in that award out of all of the solicitors in the UK uh, was, uh, was a real accolade. Um, I've actually been Solicitor of the Year runner-up twice uh, because I was then subsequently runner-up in the Law Society Excellence Awards in 2011 uh, for my innovative approach uh, to access to legal services for small business owners. Um, so never the winner, twice the bridesmaid, but you know I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, I've had a really varied experience from obviously setting up my own small businesses and working with micro businesses for the past uh, seven or eight years since I set up my own practice. But on the other side of the fence, I've led billion pound deals, um, you know, high multi multi-million pound deals and very comfortable at both ends of the spectrum. And I've had a really broad ranging view of data protection law. I'm now consulting with multinationals on data protection. And believe me, you have nothing to worry about uh, compared to what they have to go through. I mean, they literally have hundreds of people employed and, and, and as consultants uh, to help them to be compliant with GDPR. 
Um, so there you go. Now you might be wondering what the picture of the sprouts are. Um, I always like to include a little quirky fact about me. That is, I'm a complete foodie. I will eat anything and everything. Absolutely love food of all varieties, uh, particularly fine dining. Um, the one thing I won't eat is sprouts. Uh, so if you ever invite me around to your house for dinner, no sprouts, please. Okay, so that's all I'll say about me. But I think the message I just want to give you is rest assured you're in safe hands here. Um, I am a very experienced commercial and data protection lawyer. And my main aim, um, and as it has been in my, in my practice for the last um, eight years, is to really make uh, what can often be complex laws very simple for small business owners. And that's my aim for you today. Okay, so the overview of GDPR. So as I'm sure you know, I hope you know by now, GDPR, which stands for the General Data Protection Regulation, it replaces the current EU directive to harmonize national data protection laws within a single framework. And it implies directly in all 28 EU member states, and it comes into effect on May the 25th, 2018. Now that means, ladies and gentlemen, that in theory, we have to be compliant with this law by the 25th of May. Um, and if when we, when we say to the regulator or to the ICO and we say, oh, I didn't know about this, um, I haven't, you know, can we not have some time to put it into effect? They'll say, sorry, chaps, you've had two years notice uh, to put this into effect. Um, so May the 25th is compliance date. Um, and we should have all, you know, people, I think the small business community is just about now really getting hot on this, but we've had two years uh, to think about this and to put this into place. Now, we've got, how many months have we got before May the 28th? What We're on the end of February now. So we've got March, April, and most of May. So we've got three months. And the simple steps that I'm going to show you, uh, we can easily achieve in that time. So don't panic, okay? But you need to be aware of that date and you need to be working towards compliance for that date. Now, compliance is mandatory. Uh, can't opt out a GDPR. Certain bits of it do apply to certain organizations and, and certain bits don't. So for example, the obligation to appoint a data protection officer only applies to certain organizations. The obligation to, um, to, to have records of your data processing only applies to certain organizations, but in the main, it's mandatory. If you are controlling and processing the personal data of an individual who, who resides in the EU, then this applies to you. And we'll come on to the definitions of personal data and processing in a little bit. Now it applies to entities outside of the EU if they offer goods or services to or monitor the behavior of EU residents. So actually this is, this is one of the laws that, that as a, I'm, I'm qualified in English law, um, it's one of the laws that does have international application. And, and there's many, I'm sure many, many businesses um, in the online space uh, in the U United States, in Canada, in Australia, in wherever, that offer, you know, they market to the EU because they've got their website up and if they're coaches or consultants or internet marketers, then chances are, even if they don't have customers in the EU, then they have prospects in the EU. So this equally applies to entities outside of the EU. And what I'd love for you to do, um, if you are outside of the EU, if you're in the States or Canada or Australia or wherever you are, if you can pop that in the chat box, that would be awesome to know if we have any uh, international uh, any international business owners here. Now, it is, it, I think it's slowly being picked up in those jurisdictions that there is an impact. Um, uh, you know, certainly mag articles in Forbes ha have been running over the past few months that are stressing the impact to uh, businesses within the United States and um, how how um, uh, how people on the ground are actually relating to it and realizing the need to comply um, is another matter. So I'm going to be having those conversations um, with some of my US contacts to, to get a bit of a feel on that. OK, super. So. Let's move on now, this lady here. Um, I'm really pleased it's a lady. You know, a lady is spearheading this um, this this uh, this new regime, which is fantastic. Um, her name is Elizabeth Denham. Uh, she is the Information Commissioner, and this this quote that I've picked out really for me um, is is the message that I want you to take home. It's it's about more than legislative box ticking. 
Accountability is at the centre of all of this, of getting it right today, getting it right in May 2018, and getting it right beyond that. And it's it's not enough to just think of it as a, oh, I'm going to get all my ducks in a row for May and then forget about it. It is something that we really need to think about on an ongoing basis, um, not just in May, but beyond that. And what does accountability mean? Well, accountability really means looking at the culture within your business. Um, if it's just you, you know, it's still the same. It's, it's about accountability within the business. Um, and that's why there's a switch from things like, you know, at the moment, and certainly in the UK, we're supposed to pay £35 to the Information Commissioner's Office. And we put on a register, a publicly accessible register, the data that we currently process. Now, that's changing. You don't have to do that anymore. Um, post GDPR, the fee is changing to something else. I'll tell you about that later. Um, but but it's more the accountability internally in terms of keeping the records and um, realizing actually that this is an opportunity. And I'll, I'll come on to why that is in a minute. Um, and, and as she said, this is from Elizabeth Denham. Arguably, the biggest change is around accountability. Um, the GDPR mandates organizations to put into place comprehensive but proportionate governance measures. And I think that's a key word too, it's proportionate. And that's good news for us small business owners, okay? Because the lengths that they're going to expect us to go to, to comply, uh, are different to what they're going to be expecting multinationals who whose core activity is processing data. Um, it's gonna be very different in terms of what the lengths that we need to go to to comply. Um, and she goes on to say, it means a change to the culture of an organisation. That isn't an easy thing to do. And it's certainly true that accountability can't be bolted on. It needs to be part of the company's overall systems approach to how it manages and processes personal data. But this shift in approach is what is needed. It's what consumers expect. The benefit for organisations is not just compliance, but also providing an opportunity to develop the trust of its consumers in a sustained way. This is about trust, ladies and gentlemen. And I'd like to invite you for one moment just to think about it on the other side of the fence. So not you as a small business owner that's thinking, oh gosh, you know, this is just more um, box ticking, more compliance, more red tape. It's a nightmare. I haven't got the time to deal with this. Think of it in terms of you as an individual and how precious your data is to you and how annoyed you are when companies mistreat your personal data. And, and that's what this, this the whole legislation is trying to encourage a culture shift where where data is recognized for the valuable asset that it is and that companies are treating that data in the correct way in order to develop trust of consumers in a sustained way okay so why is this why is it important um, that we listen to this bit of legislation and then take any action whatsoever well the headline hype about it is that there are fines. It is true that there are fines of up to 20 million euros or up to 4% of global turnover for the previous 12 months, whichever is higher. Um, that is a striking headline when you think that in the UK at the moment, the maximum fine is 500,000 pounds. So that is a significant uplift. And as I say, the reason for that is it's to demonstrate how seriously the Europe is taking the issue of data protection um, and how times are changing and how data is the most valuable asset. OK, so that's the headline figure. Now, what is the chance of you as a small business getting fined 20 million? I would say exceptionally low. OK, so we don't need to worry about that. And as I say, you know, the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK and supervisory authorities in the EU do not have the budget to have a big police force of, of you know, data inspectors that go around assessing everybody on the 25th of May to check that you are strictly compliant with GDPR. OK, but the potential here, the, the, what the danger is, is that as our customers become more um, clued up about the data protection rights that they have, if they perceive that you are misusing their data, then they can complain. Um, so that isn't actually on this slide. The, 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 the second point there is actually a separate point, but they can complain as they have been able to do previously. There's nothing new. Um, they can complain to the ICO, which could spark an investigation. Now, as a small business owner, the last thing that you want to do is to have an, a, a regulatory body 
investigating you. Okay, we haven't got the time to deal with that. We haven't got the resources to deal with that. And frankly, it's a very unpleasant process. Okay, you want to avoid that at all costs. Now, even if they did investigate you and said you're not compliant and all they do is reprimand you, which is what they, they could choose to do, um, you still don't want the investigation in the first place. Okay, so my message to you is that the thing to be thinking about is, is how to make your customers happy um, so that they, you know, that they can trust you with their data and um, so that they don't feel the need to complain to the ICO. They can claim compensation, so that's what that is what has changed. And um, there is now a potential for class actions. So for bigger companies that are processing data, where a whole class of individuals have been affected by a data breach or whatever it might be, there is a potential for class actions. So not just a fine from the regulatory authority, but also a potential for class actions. And that's huge for the bigger companies. I think as small business owners, we don't need to worry so much about that. But what we need to worry about is the fact that our customers can complain to the ICO and it's brand and reputation damage because we will see a culture shift with this. Um, and people that aren't playing by the rules, companies that aren't playing by the rules will have their brand and reputation damaged by doing that. So it's something we need to take seriously, but not lose sleep over, okay? I can't stress that enough. There's a lot of hype about GDPR. A lot of people saying, oh, it's the next Y2K, um, you know, you've got to be absolutely compliant. And, and it's, it's brilliant that you're taking it so seriously. And I've, I see from the questions in the Facebook group how seriously you are taking it down to the, you know, the nth level of detail um, about, you know, business, what happens if I have business cards lying on my desk, you know, to that level of, of kind of question. Don't worry about that. OK, I'm going to tell you some simple stuff as to how you can work towards compliance. And to be honest, you know, if you are investigated on you know, the 25th, of, that's not going to happen. I'm sure the you know, nobody's going to be investigated on the 25th of May. But if you are, if you can show the regulator that you are working towards compliance and that you've taken some sensible steps to comply with the legislation, that's going to go a long way in helping you to um, not have a, uh, you know, any kind of fine or anything other than a, um, a reprimand and a suggestion as to how you can do things better. OK, so let me just have a quick check, scan down the comments here, see what I'm missing out on, because although I said it was I wanted it to be interactive, I haven't actually been able to look at your um, your comments here. OK, so your Yotta, I hope I said that right, Yotta is saying, what's the Facebook group? Um, that is, um, I have a group specifically for online entrepreneurs in um, uh, in Facebook. I will send, with the replay, we'll send the link to that group. So for those of you who aren't yet in there, then please do uh, go and check that. Oh, thank you, Kim. Actually, Kim has shared the link for that. Thank you, Kim. That's that's very helpful indeed. So if you haven't yet joined the um, the Facebook group, do go and check that out. Um, Penny saying we've had two years to put this into place, but the guidelines from the ICO um, are not finalised. Yes, absolutely right. That is uh, one thing that um, it seems to be never ending, doesn't it? The, um, the consultations and the guidance that's coming out uh, does seem to trickle through. You're absolutely right on that, Penny. Um, OK. Uh, Alan says it's an opportunity to, for small businesses to build trust with clients and prospects. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we have to take the positive out of this. Super. OK, good. So actually, oh, I've seen there's a separate place for questions and some clever ones of you have actually popped the questions in there. Um, OK, so Ben asked an interesting question, which is that there are many companies in the UK that are run by individuals, you know, like freelancers and builders that have always had client data and are not registered with the ICO. How is GDPR going to change that when the ICO, ICO don't and won't inspect individual companies? Yes. Yeah, so I think I've covered that, actually, Ben, haven't I, in that, um, the, as I say, the ICO don't have this big police force that is going around uh, that is checking everybody. There are many, many small business owners that haven't registered at the moment. And, you know, I'm sure nothing has happened to them. This is a changing culture. And as I've said, the, the risk here to us as small businesses is really that consumers 
are going to become much more savvy about it. They will know that they can complain to the ICO. They will know that they can claim compensation potentially. And if we do things with, you know, look, you know, if we don't follow the letter of the law, but the spirit is there and we're respecting our customers and respecting their data, chances are, you know, we are not going to be in any way reported or picked up on any minuscule non-compliances with the legislation. So that's why I'm saying we need to take it seriously. Um, we need to look at taking some certain simple steps, but we don't need to be losing sleep over complying with the exact letter of every law. OK, let's move on. OK, oh, the opportunity. OK, so we've kind of covered this. Um, but I do just want, I really want to stress this because a lot of, I think the, the sort of small business community is seeing GDPR as just a very unwelcome hassle. And actually, it could be just a brilliant opportunity to look at our existing databases. Um, we can look at cleaning out those databases. I'm terrible at this. You know, I haven't cleaned my database out in many, many years. And as a result, my, you know, my email deliverability is relatively low um, because I have a lot of people who are not engaged with my content and therefore, you know, a low um, open rate, which impacts on my deliverability. I'd be much better actually to have a smaller list that is more engaged um, which would mean that you know a higher percentage of those people who actually want to see my content will receive it so i think we need to look at it as a really good opportunity for doing that and that's not just now but ongoing and i'll talk a little bit more about that um in terms of consent and and how often we have to refresh consent going forwards um, but databases will be leaner and marketing more targeted. And, and that account accountability that I talked about could really provide a competitive advantage in terms of really making it clear to the customers that you value their data um, and that they can trust you with that data. And Elizabeth Denham says, the approach, yes, the approach may require an upfront investment in privacy fundamentals, which it does. Uh, but it offers a payoff down the line, not just in better legal compliance, but a competitive edge, whether that means attracting more customers or more efficiently meeting pressing public policy needs. I believe there is a real opportunity for organizations to present themselves on the basis of how they respect the privacy of individuals. OK, so let's see the opportunity. I invite you, ladies and gentlemen, to see the opportunity and to be really positive about this piece of legislation. OK, now let's get into the nuts and bolts of it. Who, who doesn't agree with that, by the way? Let's uh, pop a little message in the chat box. Can you see the opportunity here or is it all doom and gloom? Uh, pop a little message in the chat box. I'd be interested to know your views on that whilst I take a little slurp of my tea. OK, I'm seeing lots of yeses. Definitely an opportunity. Any Anybody not agreeing with that? Trust is hugely important. It's an opportunity to increase professionalism. <laughs> Brent says, I think it's a way to tease small business owners. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, Janet says she'd much rather have a targeted audience than a big disinterested one. Uh, Sarah says, made me shake things up a bit and get active with renewing my lists, getting much better open rates and interaction. Great. Nicola said, it's definitely an opportunity, just feeling the pain at having to do it. Nicola, there needs to be no pain. OK, all you need to do is invest two hours in this training and then take one more step that I'm going to tell you about at the end and you're done. OK, the, you know, the pain is minimal. OK, so um, good. Well, I'm glad that you're all... Um, being quite positive about it. That's the good news. All right. So let's get this is really back to basics, uh, because I think if, if people bear in mind the fundamentals of this legislation, um, and a lot of it isn't new, some of the definitions have been tweaked, but they're pretty much the same as what we've already got. Um, if you understand the fundamentals, then the, the kind of everyday questions that you might have, you'll be you will be more able to answer easier. OK, so let's look at personal data, uh, which is often the, the sort of first uh, confusing stumbling block. Um, now, the, the, date, the, the definition has been changed somewhat, and there's a couple of things that have been brought in that are new. Um, but in its essence, it's the same as what we're already dealing with. It's any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And that's who we talk about as the data subject. Uh, so that's all your prospects, for example, your customers. Um, 
an identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly, in particular by reference to an identifier, such as a name, an identification number, a location number, an online identifier, or to one or more factors specific to the physical blah, 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 blah. Okay, the key things there are that name and email address are clearly personal data. That hasn't changed, okay? What has changed is that now IP addresses and cookies could be, um, according to the Working Party guidance, could be um, information relating to identifiable natural persons. So the scope has extended a little bit. But for our purposes on this training, if you've got a list of people with a name and an email address, that is personal data. Okay, if anyone's got any specific questions about random bits of personal data that you need to work out whether that's covered by this legislation or not, pop it in the, the, uh, the chat box or the question box. But generally, you know, every, everything that we hold in terms of name, phone number, um, address, email address, um, everything like that is personal data, okay? Now there is a separate type of personal data called sensitive data or special category data. And I'll come on to that later because we have different rules for dealing with that, okay? Um, but if you process personal data, then this uh, legislation applies to you. Now processing, the definition of processing is very broad and it essentially means anything that's done to or with personal data, <laughs> with personal data, including simply collecting it, storing or deleting the data. Okay, so somebody asked in the Facebook group the other day um, about, you know, they, they gather data from, um, I think from memory it was from, um, you know, sort of business cards that they'd collected um, or maybe it was from names on a, con on a list of people attending a function and she'd stored that data but not done anything with it. Is that still processing? Yes, it is. Okay, so you don't actually even have to be emailing people for this to apply just purely collecting it, just the act of collecting it, even if you don't store it, that brings you into the realms of uh, this legislation. So basically anything that you do that involves or affects personal data is more than likely processing and it brings you within the realms of this legislation. Okay, now I know there's a lot of um, text on this slide and I'm not gonna go through it in a lot of detail, but, there are data protection principles that we need to comply with. And these really go through the heart of the legislation. Of course, there are practical examples that arise from these, but if you bear these principles in mind, as you, you know, look at your existing data processing, as you're getting fresh consents, as you're um, working out how to comply with the legislation, as you deal with things going forwards, if you bear in mind these data protection principles, you won't go far wrong. Okay, now they're very similar actually to what we have already. Again, the wording has been tweaked slightly, but very similar to what we have already. Now, let's pick out the key bits here for our purposes. And I'm actually gonna walk you through these in a, in a, uh, in a, in a sort of sales and marketing journey, if you like, the um, uh, sales and marketing cycle and point out how these principles will apply during that cycle. Okay, but. So looking at the first one, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. What does transparency mean? Well, all it means is you tell the individual what you're gonna do with their data, okay? So that seems fair, doesn't it? You say, I'll collect your data, but, but I'll also tell you what I'm going to do with it. That sounds fair. Fair is a word that's in there, and fair means what is processed must match up with how it's been described. Okay, so the fair bit of that is if you tell the subject what the data processing is going to be done, you need to tell it them in a way that where the processing will actually match what has been described. That makes sense to me too. Okay, lawful means that you must have a lawful ground for processing and this is a big part of the jigsaw and we're gonna be coming onto that in a lot of detail in a bit. Um, purpose limitation, uh, you can only uh, collect data for a specific specific processing purpose that the subject's been, um, been made aware of. So that links in with the transparency side. Um, and personal data can only be obtained for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes. So basically, 
just collect the data for what you're telling them that you're going to do about do with it okay in summary data minimization is all about only collecting the data that's necessary okay don't ask for the kitchen sink okay don't ask them if they're married don't ask them what their shoe size is don't ask them if they like chocolate okay keep it to the bare minimum as to what you actually need to um to to for the processing that you've told them that you're going to do it with so if you say to them um would you like my newsletter then all you need is their name and their email address okay arguably maybe you need the phone number in case the email address um they've given you an incorrect email address and you want to follow up on that and get the correct email address but really at its at its core what you need for that newsletter to process the data for that purpose is the name and the email address accuracy personal data shall be accurate and kept up to date seems fair to me you don't want you know inaccurate data about people uh, storage limitation um, keep it for only as long as it's necessary for the purpose for which the personal data is stored so if you um, you obtained a, a number of people's email addresses because you said hey I've got this really cool newsletter do you want to sign up for my newsletter and they say yes great and then six months down the line you decide to stop doing your newsletter then you have to delete those uh, email addresses because you're no longer processing that data for the purposes for which the personal data was collected. Finally, integrity and um, confidentiality. Well, as you might expect, we want to make sure that the data is secure. Certainly as individuals, I want to know that my data is secure. And as obviously as on the other side of the fence, as, as the business owner and the data controller, we need to have certain measures in place to secure personal data that guard against unauthorized or unlawful processing, accidental loss, destruction, damage, etc. Okay, so now I'm not, no way an expert in that area, okay? Um, but if we are using, um, you know, if we're using well-known, say for example, email marketing services like MailChimp, Aweber, Infusionsoft, um, we can hope, and, and actually as part of GDPR, we should be, you know, certainly uh, finding out that this is the case, that they have the appropriate um, safeguards in place to protect that data. Okay. Um, you know, it's also examples like using if we're using cloud software for storage of data like Dropbox, you know, we're using something that is a recognized leader in its field like Dropbox rather than your mate down the road solution, um, you know, of, of whatever he's done, you know, and, and he's got a couple of customers. You know, we're, we're obviously a small business owner in a much stronger position to say, actually, we've gone with the market leader. Um, and, and if we can say, and I've looked into their security and I am, I am, you know, I am happy that it, they have the safeguards in place, uh, then that is a good thing. Okay, let me have a quick glance down the question list. Goodness me, there's lots. I might have to skim through them. Um, Elaine says, is privacy policy getting old? Should we maybe use data protection policy? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if that's a question about the wording of it or whether you need to refresh your privacy policy. Um, certainly, you do need to refresh your privacy policy, and I'll be coming on to that in a bit. Uh, Danielle says, does this scope include photos of people? She's asking as a wedding photographer. Yes, it does. Uh, people can be identified from um, a photo. Uh, work email address and mobile number. Yep, the GDPR does not differentiate between uh, work email addresses and mobile numbers. Um, if the person can be identified from a work email address, then it falls within this um, legislation. Now, there are other uh, bits of legislation that do distinct, di differentiate between it, and that's outside the scope um, of this training. Um, but certainly, as far as GDPR is concerned, work and personal email addresses are exactly the same. It's whether you can identify the individual or they are identifiable. Annabelle says, I work for a marketing agency which uses other businesses' data lists. Does this make us processor and controller? Yes, it does. Um, okay, I think the other questions that I'm skimming through, we're going to come on to deal about deal with soon. Okay. Helen says, where do we find a list of secure cloud software to use? I don't think there is one, Helen. Um, I think that you have to um, um, certainly with the ones that are based in the States, I did a video on, of this in the Facebook group because um, not only is it a matter of 
um, security of data for those, but it's also about transfers outside of the EEA. If they're based in the United States or outside, anywhere outside of the EEA, there are specific laws um, in GDPR about uh, transfer of data outside of the EEA. I did a video all about that. Um, and checking whether they are part of the EU US Privacy Shield. Now, there's a searchable database for that. And if they are on there, then you, I'm sure you can, uh, you know, you would be able to rely on the fact that they are, they do have appropriate safeguards in place, because indeed that's how they've been able to get onto that, um, that list of, of people being within that EU US Privacy Shield. So check out that video in the Facebook group. It was all about um, international data transfers. The easy way to find it is you go into the videos tab of the Facebook group, you hover over the video and the title comes up. Okay, so I hope that helps. All right. Um, uh, 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 let me just see if there's anything else I need to need to gather here. Okay, so there's lots of questions about photographs. I'm going to do a separate video on that. Uh, in the Facebook group. So for all you photographers or people who are using photos, then um, I'll do a separate video on that in the Facebook group. Okay. Right. So let's look at the sales and marketing lifecycle and how those uh, principles overlay that process. Okay. Now I have to say thank you to um, HubDot uh, for taking this idea um, from them, the way that they set it out. Thank you very much. Um, but I really like this, the way that it um, it shows how data protection rules overlay the sales and marketing lifecycle. So the first stage is obviously data collection. And two of the principles apply there. And they are the principles of um, transparency, fairness and lawfulness and of data minimization. OK, so at the point of data collection, you need to be telling the data subject up front what you're going to do with that data. And you need to have a lawful ground for processing. We're going to come on to what those are in a moment. But the two that we're probably going to be focusing on mainly in the context of sales and marketing um, and online stuff is um, consent and legitimate interests. OK, so you need to be thinking about that up front. OK, so are you being completely transparent about what you're going to do with their data? OK, and the, the best place for that, that um, information to go is a privacy policy. Um, now, the GDPR actually specifies a number of things that need to be included in a privacy policy. Um, and, uh, you know, it is no longer sufficient. Well, generally, it's no longer sufficient. I'll come on to consent um, as a leg legitimate ground for processing in a bit. But generally, it will no longer, if you're relying on consent as a ground for processing, it will no longer be sufficient to have a link to a privacy policy just floating in the footer of your website, which is what a lot of people have now. I don't know if you, you when you look to the bottom of the website, often you'll see there's website terms of use, there's a privacy policy and there's a cookie policy uh, and, and nothing else that really draws your attention to those links. Now going forward, that's not going to be sufficient. There needs to be, it needs to be upfront about at the point of collection, what you're actually going to do with that data um, and certainly in, in the realms of cons when we come to consent in a little bit i'll show you some examples of, of the form that you need to use to get that consent okay but you need to be really transparent with them you need to be telling the data subject exactly what you're going to be doing with that data and you need to be breaking it down um, into the different uh, purposes so if you're collecting data for a newsletter then that needs to be one bullet point. If you are um, collecting it so that because you want to send them your offers going forwards, that needs to be a separate bullet point. If you are collecting it because um, you want to transfer it to a third party for some reason, then that needs to be a separate bullet point. OK, so you need to be really clear about what you're doing with that data. Um, data minimization also comes in at that point, because as I said before, you don't want to be asking for the kitchen sink. Just think sensibly about what do you actually need to, for the purposes of processing that data. OK, the next stage is the data storage and processing. And there's four principles that come into play there. The first is is purpose and usage 
limitation. So that is really that, you know, once you've been upfront about what you're using the data for, don't, don't go against that and use it for something else. You know, this is all about building trust people, you know. So once you've got the consent, be really clear that you can't go beyond that consent or beyond, if it's not consent, go, go beyond what you have told people that you are going to be doing with their data. The second thing there is security. We've already talked about that. And um, that's an ongoing uh, ongoing thing to consider. Um, you know, and, and I'd love to actually invite somebody. In fact, I'm going to write that on my list now. I'm going to invite a, a data security expert to come and do an interview with me in the Facebook group um, about, you know, what are what we should be thinking about in this sense um, as a small business owner. Now, remember, there is, you know, this concept of proportionality. So us as small business owners are not going to have to go to the levels of security and safeguarding as a multinational will. Um, but we, we do need to have um, certain safeguards. And, that, and <coughs> excuse me, that, that goes to things like filing cabinets, because the, the GDPR does apply to offline processing as well. So if you still have hard copy files um, and you're keeping data in, a, in, in any kind of filing system, then you need to be thinking about the security of that too. So, you know, you'd be having it in files marked confidential, you'd be locking, the, making sure that the, the, the drawer's locked, et cetera. But that needs to be, um, it's a principle that runs throughout. And that's why I'm saying, you know, it's a, it's a culture change. Um, it's not just a box ticking exercise that we do before May and forget about it, it's ongoing. Um, accuracy, that's, a, that's an ongoing um, obligation on us because we must keep data accurate and up to date. And how do we do that? Um, you know, and I think that, you know, it's, it will, it's, it's very good practice. And I think I suspect we'll, we'll see it becoming more, more common is that in, in the context of our email lists and, and any other information that we collect about people, we will regularly be going back to those people to say, you know, maybe once every six months to say, here is the data that we hold on you. Please confirm that it's all accurate and up to date. And if not, please edit as appropriate. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of that. Um, accountability runs through it. Um, this is a kind of an overarching principle, if you like, that I talked about early, earlier. And that is about the record keeping. It's about, you know, if we um, notice that there's been a data protection breach, we have to notify um, our supervisory authority within 72 hours of that breach. Um, it's the ongoing duty to appoint a data protection officer if we need to. Chances are, I don't want to panic you, chances are that most people on this call will not need to appoint a data protection officer. So please don't worry about that. There is a video that I have done on this point in the group. So if you are a slightly larger company and that you think that you might fall within that, then have a quick scan of that video to work out whether you need it or not. But there is this ongoing accountability. And then we come to the end of the relationship where we shed a few tears and, and part ways. Um, and this is where the, um, you know, either the processing that we that we acquired the data for has come to an end or, um, you know, in a practical example, somebody has asked to opt out of your mailing list. You're not sending them content that's exciting them anymore. They're opting out. And then we need to think about retention and um, and deletion and, and those those principles. Um, so that is all I want to say about that. I hope that is helpful in, in, in more of a visual mapping, uh, because I just want to get the message across that there's obviously a lot to think about up front when you're collecting the data, but that actually flows through uh, the, the prospect customer relationship um, and, and overlays all of it. So we need to be thinking about it uh, you know, continuously throughout the life cycle of sales and marketing. Any thoughts on that, guys, um, or any specific questions? Um, but I, as a visual aid, I think I, I quite like that, which is why I borrowed it. Um, OK, let me have a quick scan down here and see um, if there's anything completely relevant to what we've been talking about. Brent, I can see you're the cynic um, on the call. Uh, Brent says, so more spam mail about what uh, your what personal data is stored about you. 
Um, yes, well, I, I, you know, certainly I, I'm not sure how we fulfill the obligation to keep accurate data um, if, if we don't actually do that. Di, don't feel scared. Put a little comment in the box about why you're scared, because I've, I hopefully I've not said anything that should scare you. Um, how does GDPR fit with the privacy of it, with the PECR, the privacy of electronic communications regs? Yep, that's been asked in the group, and I'm going to do a separate video on that, Sarah Jane. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Yes, I will share the slides in the Facebook group. Um, Muriel says, as a therapist, we need to keep data for a certain number of years. How does that work? Okay, good question, um, Muriel. So the, the GDPR doesn't actually specify the any length of time that you need to retain data or any period by which you need to delete data. Okay, it is, um, it is whatever is um, necessary for the purposes of the processing or indeed to comply with legal obligations. So if you've got, if by law you have to keep certain documents, like you have to keep your tax records, you have to keep employment records, that type of thing. Um, and certainly, you know, for contractual purposes, the limitation period is six years. So you'd want to keep all, all of that data for six years. Um, that is absolutely fine. Okay, there's nothing in the GDPR that is cutting across the, the legal requirements to store data. Okay, it's really a, it's a sense check about what is necessary. Is it necessary for you still to hold this data? Okay, if you know the relationship has ended, if uh, they've opted out, if whatever's happened. Okay, there's no hard and fast rules about it. Okay, some questions about consent. We're going to come on to and have a really thorough um, overview of consent. Heidi, your question about, do I need to ask clients every six months whether you can keep them, their names on the list? I'm gonna come on to tell you about. Okay, let us move on. And thank you for your questions. There's so many coming in that I can't actually answer them all. So if I don't answer your questions on this session, please do feel free to post them in the Facebook group and I will get round to uh, doing some kind of video or Facebook Live to address them. Okay, so legal grounds for processing. Now this is key. OK, because if you don't have a legal ground for processing, then you're processing it illegally. And that's where people will complain. The regulator will investigate you and potentially you could get fined. So the two that we're really interested in on this training are consent and legitimate interests. Now, consent, as you might expect, is where the individual has given clear consent for you to process their personal data for a specific purpose. OK, keywords there. Clear consent. I'm going to come on to the, you know, the definition of, of consent in a little bit, um, because there is a higher standard of consent necessary under GDPR than what we have at the moment. Um, and it's for a specific purpose. And that goes back to what we were talking about before, about being transparent, about why you're collecting the data and what you're going to do with it. Now, legitimate interest is a um, an interesting one. And um, we're going to come on to that um, in a little bit, because there is a specific mention of legitimate interests for direct marketing um, in the, um, the recitals. And, and, and I think initially a lot of marketers got very excited by that and thought, oh, good marketing, we don't have to comply with um, uh, you know, with getting consent, we can rely on legitimate interests. Um, not quite so straightforward, I'm afraid, so we're going to come on to that. Um, but what legitimate interest says is it's where the process is necessary for your legitimate interests or the legitimate interests of a third party, but this is the key bit, unless there is a good reason to protect the individual's personal data which overrides those legitimate interests. And I'll come on to give you some examples of what legitimate interests might be. The other ones, just so that you know, um, contract, if the processing is necessary for a contract that you have with the individual or because they've asked you to take sp specific steps before entering a contract, then that's the ground. You don't need to get additional consent. An example of that might be where um, you uh, run an online shop, um, you ask them for their name and their address because you need to deliver something to them. OK, you don't need consent for that. That's a contractual thing. You cannot fulfill that contractual obligation if you don't get their name and their address. Now, if you ask them for their email address um, or their phone number, um, you know, arguably that is not necessary for that contract. You might say, well, actually, I need a phone number in case they're not not there or they've made a mistake with the um, uh, with the delivery address. 
um, you know, that's sort of arguable. Um, but if you say, if you make, um, uh, if, if there's something else in there which isn't necessary for the contract, so for example, say um, you make it a condition of sale um, that they um, let me uh, refer to customers to you, um, or, or that's kind of requested as part of the data collection process, um, then that obviously would not be included in in the um, the contract grounds for processing. You would have to get consent, specific consent for that. And of course, that was not a good example because that then brings you into the realms of thinking about the, the data protection for the two people that they're referring. So not a great example. Um, but you get the point that um, it's only where the, the data is necessary for the contract um, the data that you're asking for and the processing that you're doing is necessary for the contract that you have with the individual. Um, and another example is employee data. Uh, you know, payroll information is uh, the legal grounds for processing that will be contract because you can't um, uh, adhere to your employment contract that says that you're going to pay them a certain amount into their bank account if you don't have their employee details. Legal obligations is another ground, and that's where the processing is necessary for you to comply with the law. And that is where, for example, again, on an employment um, example, uh, if you have um, data about employees that you're passing to the tax man because you need that to fulfill a legal obligation, then that is a legal ground for processing. OK, the other two um, probably aren't relevant to many of you. Uh, vital interests, the processing is necessary to protect someone's life or public task, the processing is necessary for you to perform a task in the public interest or for your official functions. Okay, so I suspect that nobody is going to come into the realms of, of those. But the ones we're going to be focusing on are consent and legitimate interests. Now, as I said, there is a higher standard of consent with GDPR. And the, the, the recital says that consent should be given by a clear affirmative act, establishing a freely given, specific, informed and unambiguous indication of the data subject's agreement to the processing of personal data relating to him or her, such as by a written statement, um, including by electronic means or an oral statement. So interestingly, oral statements apply, but we'll come on to why that's a problem in a bit. But the, the key thing that we need to uh, really understand here is this means no more opt-outs. It means no more pre-ticked boxes. It means genuine choice and control. Um, over uh, the, the data. Um, so if, as I say, you know, we've had the privacy policy in the little link at the bottom of the website, um, that is not sufficient under GDPR. Um, the fact that you say, um, you know, um, we will, uh, if you have a little sign up box for your freebie and you say, you know, we will be sending, enter your um, email address here to receive your freebie and underneath it, we will be sending you um, you know, emails about offers and things that we think might interest you, not sufficient, okay? There needs to be an affirmative act, a clear affirmative act that's specific, informed and unambiguous about their agreement to the processing, okay? So this also brings into question the transparency about the purposes of processing, and we've already talked about that and what that means. That means just being really upfront about um, what you're actually going to be doing with that data and where that needs to go is in your uh, ideally in your privacy policy um, which would be in an ideal world here's how it would work right you would have your if we're thinking about a, an online funnel you would have your opt-in box where you say hey come and get this amazing freebie give me your name and email address and in an ideal world you would have a little tick box under that that says um, we have read, um, the uh, um, uh, the privacy policy. Um, next tick box. We agree to you sending you sending us your newsletter. Next tick box. We agree to you um, letting us know about special offers that you might have. Uh, next tick box. We agree to you um, disclosing our information to X, Y, and Z third party. So that's it. It needs to be as detailed as possible. And we need to be giving separate options. So no more blanket consent where it's, you know, you, you've got to consent to everything because some people might want to get your newsletter, for example, but they might not want to have offers or they might not want for the information to be disclosed to X, Y and Z person. So we need to be as granular as possible about the 
um, the consent options. Okay, it comes back to this, this concept of genuine choice and control. Now, what do you need to actually put in your new updated privacy policy? Um, well, the, um, the, the legislation does actually specify um, a number of uh, areas of information that you need to um, put into um, the privacy policy. <clears throat> and I'll just, I'll just read out a few of them just to give you a flavor. I'm not gonna go through all of them because there are a lot. Um, but I will be telling you at the end of this training where you can get hold of a, a GDPR compliant privacy policy. And, and just on that point, ladies and gentlemen, I would really recommend that you don't try and cobble together a new GDPR compliant privacy policy yourself. Um, because chances are you won't cover everything, you'll get it wrong. Um, far better to know that it is actually compliant. Um, don't copy them from other, other places on the web. That's infringement of intellectual property rights and could get you sued. Um, so far better to, and, and also just might not be relevant to you. So I see it so much. Please, please don't be tempted to do it. I know it's a small business. Um, you know, m money is at a premium, but um, please don't be tempted to do it because it, you know, it could, could land you in all kinds of hot water. Um, so the kinds of things that you need to include in um, your, your privacy policy. So obviously, your um, as a controller, your identity and your contact details. Um, if you've got a data protection officer, you have to give the details of the data protection officer. The pur now these are the key parts: the purposes of the processing for which the personal data is intended, as well as the legal basis for the processing. Okay, so you need to actually set out the legal basis for the processing. So if you if you are um, say sending someone a newsletter, um, then that, chances are the ground for that processing is going to be consent. You need to specify that. If you're relying on legitimate interests for some other type of processing, then that needs to be spelt out in the privacy policy as well. Yeah, you need to, where applicable, if you intend to transfer personal data outside of the EEA, and then you need to re refer to the appropriate or suitable safeguards um, and, and various other things. So do make sure um, that your privacy policy is actually, if you're gonna go to the time and effort of replacing your privacy policy um, in the hope that it's GDPR compliant, then make sure it is. Don't try and cobble it together yourself or copy one from somewhere else who, to be frank, might have cobbled it together themselves and got it all wrong. So please do go to um, a reliable source of, um, you know, for, for a GDPR privacy policy. And as I say, I'm going to tell you at the end how you can very affordably get hold of a GDPR compliant privacy policy. Okay, let me see if there's any questions on that before we come on to sensitive data. My goodness me, lots of questions, lots and lots of questions. Okay, so Libby says, if I have a quarterly newsletter sign-up box on a website where there was no freebie giveaway and it clearly states it's a quarterly newsletter and I have kept all the emails requesting to be signed up via this box, are these okay or do you need to get fresh opt-ins? Um, it depends is the answer, Libby. Um, it depends if you've given them the other information that you're required to do so. Um, which is typically what you'd find in the privacy policy. Um, so it depends is the answer. Now you might actually have, um, you know, the, the uh, it's a tricky one. It is a tricky one because what I was thinking is that you could follow up with the information that you need to give them and not have to get them to re-opt in. Um, I think I need to know a bit more about that, Libby, before I give you a definitive answer. I mean, it's certainly a good indication that you, you have asked for that granularity of consent for the newsletter. And we're very specific about that. Um, that is certainly, I mean, I think, you know, for, for you, Libby, I think that, um, you, you know, we all have to look at this as a risk assessment, okay? Now, what are the chances of your newsletter clients um, being annoyed at you for sending them a newsletter if it's what they've requested? OK, how likely is it that they're going to actually complain about you sending them the newsletter, particularly if it's a fantastic newsletter and they love it? OK, so 
I think the chance, you know, in terms of a risk assessment there, um, I think that, you know, it is, um, it's low um, because you've been very upfront about what you're going to do with that data. You're not expanding the scope of that purpose. Um, and, you know, hopefully you're giving them valuable content. Now, if you wanted to be absolutely beyond doubt about it, I'd go back and get fresh consent. But from what you've told me, it's low risk um, that, you know, if you, if you didn't go and get that fresh consent, um, it's low risk that um, and, and if, in fact, you did in, in actual fact need to for it to be GDPR compliant, um, it's low risk. So I think that's one for you to think about, Libby, in terms of a risk um, risk assessment exercise. Christine, please don't feel overwhelmed. It's very simple. Um, please write in the box what, which bit is feeling overwhelming. OK, so just to recap. If you're processing personal data, there has to be a legal ground for processing. Chances are it's going to be either consent or legitimate interests. For consent, all you need to know is there's no more opt outs, there's no more pre tick boxes, and you need to give people genuine choice and control. The add on to that is that there's certain things that you need to tell the data subject at the point of collecting the data um, about um, what you're going to do with that data and certain other things. That will go in a privacy policy. I'm going to tell you how you can get a GDPR compliant privacy policy at the end of this training. Okay, that's it. That's all I've said. It's not overwhelming. Honest. Honest. It's all fine. Right. Um, next. The consent, so the consent uh, for sensitive data. Um, there's an even higher standard of consent for sensitive data. What is sensitive data? Again, the definition has slightly changed. The new definition is it's data consisting of racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data, biometric data, data concerning health, or data concerning a natural person's sex life or sexual orientation. Pretty much what you'd expect, isn't it? That kind of data, if you think about it as an individual, that's the kind of data that you're gonna have a few concerns about if it gets into the wrong hands, aren't you? Okay, so as you would expect, there is a higher level of safeguarding of that particular information. And in terms of consent, what the, um, the legislation talks about and the guidance is, that we need to get explicit consent for processing sensitive data. Now, I've done a video about this, um, about just purely on this subject. Um, there is no uh, real guidance in, in the uh, GDPR itself as to what is explicit consent. The Working Party guidance is that if you have a signed statement, that is obviously explicit. So if, for example, you are a therapist, I did a video on this for, for therapists as well. So if you are if you are a therapist and you're concerned about this, then please do find that video in the group and have a watch of that. Um, if you have a form and, and you're asking people to fill in health data um, or whatever it might be, then if you have get them to sign it at the bottom, then that is clear evidence of their consent um, you know, to, to the processing. So you, so you get them to fill in the form and you have your privacy policy on the back of the form and then you get them to sign that, then that is clear evidence of their consent. Okay, now if you do it online, slightly different, but I'm not gonna go into that now, but have a little listen to the video on that. Okay, but if, if um, online, just as a quick example, if you are doing it online, maybe you've got someone to fill in a form beforehand, then have some, some kind of click throughs. So they fill in the form, they get taken to the privacy policy, they tick some boxes within that privacy policy, and then they, um, they can either um, electronically sign it or um, write in, I agree, whatever way there is of getting that affirmative um, consent that you need. And a simple way, if you don't have the software that's gonna enable you to do that, is if you are a therapist and you want them to sign it, you know, and get that information before your first session, then email it across, email the form across to them with the privacy policy on the back and um, and simply ask them to, to print it out, um, to um, sign it and to scan it back to you. Or I think, I mean, you could even get them just to email back and say, you know, draw real attention to the privacy policy on the back and get them to email back to say, I agree. I agree to the processing as set out in, um, in the privacy policy. Okay, that all clear? Okay, so all you need to remember is if you're processing sensitive data, you need to get that higher level of consent. Okay, 
which is beyond is consent beyond doubt. So I'm going to show you some examples now of the difference between normal consent and explicit consent. Okay, so they've taken this from the ICO guidance on consent. If you're particularly interested in it, then you can read that. Um, the ICO being the Information, Commissioner, Information Commissioner's Office, which is the supervisory, supervisory authority here in the UK. So company A provides the following information to individuals. Uh, and the form is email address with a little sign saying optional. We will use this to send you emails about our products and services. Now that in itself is likely to be specific, informed, unambiguous, affirmative act, but it's arguably still implied rather than explicit consent. So this would be sufficient for your non-sensitive data, okay? In, in, in just purely in terms of getting consent, I'm not talking about the other information that you have to put in your privacy policy, okay? But purely as a as a consent box, this is an example that the ICO gives. Um, because you, you're being granular about it, you're saying, we will use this to send you emails about our products and services. And if they want to do it, they pop in their email address. If they don't, then they don't pop their email address in. That's the affirmative, um, un unambiguous affirmative act. OK, but it's it's arguably still implied rather than explicit. OK, so if we move on to this one. I consent to receive emails about your products and special offers with a tick box. If the individual ticks the box, they will have explicitly consented to the processing. Now, I think this is, you know, to me, it's a little bit like splitting hairs and it's almost like the ICO has had to think about some way of showing, um, you know, an extra level of um, consent to to, um, to be able to say what the explicit consent is. But this is the example that the ICO gives. OK, so this one, this example here would be fine for non-sensitive data. And this example here is what they're saying would be explicit consent, which is what you need for sensitive data. OK. Now, the easy thing, ladies and gentlemen, rather than getting uh, you know, confused about this, feeling overwhelmed, etc., is to listen to how you can get hold of my GDPR pact that gives you all of this. OK, you know it's going to be absolutely right. You know there's going to be a privacy policy that is GDPR compliant. You know you're going to have your tick boxes that work. Um, and the other 20 documents that are going to keep you compliant, which you may or may not need to use. So don't don't worry yourself and think, oh, my goodness, I've got to put 20 documents into place. OK, because it might be that you don't employ anyone. So that's five of them out of the way straight away. OK, so don't think of it like that. I just want to give more um, in case you do need all of all of that to be compliant. OK, does that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? As I say, now, this is not my example. This is an example that I have taken from the ICO. OK. Let me just scan down your questions here and see if there's anything we need to deal with before we move on. Barbara says, I'm confused. Do you need a tick box for each bit of marketing or just one that encompasses everything? So the more specific you can be for the processing, the better, Barbara. Uh, so, yeah. So as I said before, if you have a newsletter, then ideally have a tick box for that. If you want to um, tell them about your offers, have a tick box for that. If you need to disclose it to third parties, have a tick box for that. OK. Olga says, if we're a member of your legal academy, will we have access to these? Yes, you will. The GDPR pack is going into... Um, the Legal Academy without any further charge. Uh, so yes, if you're already a member, then um, it will be uh, being drip fed into there um, throughout the course of the next couple of months. Carol says, when attending a networking group and you receive a delegates list, I normally store this in my filing cabinet. Uh, can I still do that? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I don't want you to be losing sleep over. Um, you know, is it processing personal data? Yes, it is. 
do you have to have a ground, a legal ground for storing it? Yes, you do. So in theory, you should have the consent of those people uh, to uh, store that list. Um, is anybody going to come and complain or you get fined if you actually still do that? Uh, in all probability, no. So, um, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, I've got, thank you so much for all of your um, messages and, uh, and questions here. Okay, so confusion on the granularity on the consent rule. Earlier, you said to have a tick box for each marketing piece. Yes, that is that is absolutely best practice is to have a tick box for each marketing piece. So this is, I mean, this one here that we're looking at now on the screen, I consent to receive emails about your products um, and special offers. Um, yeah, I mean, arguably, you could have split that out. The ICO say, I, as in you could have split out, I want to know about your products, and then I want to know about your special offers. They've given this as an example of something that would be combined. But the more that you can split it out, the better. OK, so that is that's the they haven't given exact details on you know, every eventuality of how we uh, get consent. But the principle is, is that consent should not be bundled. OK, you shouldn't have one consent to every every processing that you're going to do. The more that you can split that down and have separate consents for each purpose of processing the better, okay? All right, super, let's move on because I'm getting lots of questions about people who've already opted in. So let's get into that because I know that's a key question. I've done a specific Facebook Live on this in the Facebook group. So do go back to that and recap on this if you need more detail or um, an, another, another way of me expressing it because I know this is a key one. Now, I saw, um, in fact, the whole reason that I started the GDPR Facebook group was because I saw a lot of incorrect advice from very well-meaning business people uh, who'd simply uh, misinterpreted uh, things that they'd read about GDPR. And one of the things that I had had seen that was incorrect advice was that because the, there was a statement that said that the ICO had said that if you were, if you had um, compliant consents, you would not need to go out and get fresh consent. Now, the ICO did say that the key part that, that they'd missed and um, that the business owner had missed in sharing that was it's only if you've got GDPR compliant consent that you don't have to go out and get fresh consent. And as we know, there is a much higher standard of consent with GDPR than there is at the moment. So I would imagine that, that the vast majority of people do not have GDPR compliant consents. OK, so if yes, if you do have GDPR compliant consent um, and you have, um, for example, um, you know, you, you've informed them. One of, one of the obligations that we will come on to talk about is they have the right to withdraw consent at any time. And that at the point of collection, you inform them of their right to do that. If you've done that previously, then that's one example of how you're compliant. Um, if you've made consent as easy to withdraw as to give, then that's another example of being compliant. If you have um, had a specific opt in rather than opt out, that's another example of being GDPR compliant. If you've given them all of the information that you needed to give them in the privacy policy, then that's another example of being GDPR compliant. But the chances of us small business owners being having GDPR compliant consent is small. OK, so if you want to be safe about this, then, and as we've talked about earlier, it is a great opportunity to go back out to our list, um, to have that refresh, to um, engage with our uh, prospects again, and to say, look guys, you know, this privacy law's coming in. Um, it's actually really great for all of us. Um, you've been on my list for some time now. Um, you know, if, if you like the stuff, that's great. If you don't, then, you know, I'm gonna take you off my list because we now know that, you know, this is an opportunity and that actually having a smaller, more engaged list is more valuable to our business than having a big out of date list where nobody's interested in reading your stuff. So, you, you know, certainly from my perspective, I think it's a great opportunity to go back to your list and get fresh consent. And yes, you might lose a third or maybe more of your database, um, but you'll have a much more engaged list and you can start to build that up again and start really thinking about compelling content, what's going to get people to open and to engage in your emails. OK, so I hope that is clear because that is a big question. OK, if you are if you are sure that you have GDPR compliant consent already, 
as a legal ground for processing, then you don't need to do anything. Okay? If you're not sure, then go and get fresh consent. And we're actually going to be um, in the Facebook group, we're going to be um, inviting a marketer into the group to come and discuss with us the opportunities, the marketing opportunities that this presents in terms of how to run a re-engagement campaign prior to um, asking people whether they want to opt in or not. Um, so watch out for that video because I think this is a really good opportunity to think about re-engaging our lists um, and then to follow that up with um, the request for fresh GDPR compliant consent. Now, looking further down the line on that, and I saw that somebody asked this in the question earlier, should we be refreshing consent on a periodic basis and now, obviously, we, we, we should always, at the bottom of every email, say, if you want to unsubscribe from this email, click here. And most of the big email uh, service providers like MailChimp, Aweber, Infusionsoft will have that as a, as a necessity on the bottom of your email. Um, but what we should be doing is, 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 is refreshing that consent every two years. That's the guidance from the ICO. So offer a specific opt-out automatically every two years and send occasional reminders about the ability to withdraw consent. I've not seen any guidance on what, what occasional means. OK, maybe annually would be fine. Maybe probably every six monthly uh, would be fine. But they are saying that you should offer a specific opt out every two years to make sure that the people who are on your list are actually wanting that information and they're wanting you to process their data. Now, it's worth noting that data subjects have the right to withdraw their consent at any time. Um, so you can't, I mean, in terms of the grounds of processing, you can't rely on consent. And then when they withdraw their consent, say, oh, I'm going to rely on legitimate interest now or something like that. Obviously, I think that goes without saying. Um, if they withdraw their consent, then you can't process their data anymore. You've got to inform them of their right to be able to withdraw their consent at any time. And the point that we do that is at, at the point of collection of the data. The consent's got to be as easy to withdraw as to give. So if you if they're opting in online, um, filling in a little box with their email address, you can't make them write to you in person to withdraw their consent. It's, it's got to be as easy as clicking on that subscribe button on the bottom of an email. Um, and generally, the advice, the best practice advice is to review and refresh consents, um, especially as your processing option operations and the purposes of your processing evolve. So this is what I was saying. It's this ongoing um, accountability piece of looking at you know, how are your purposes of processing changing? Um, so, for example, if you set up another business that's completely unrelated to the other um, and you've got a list that was interested in one thing, then, you know, you, you shouldn't be then marketing the new business to that list. If it's you know, something completely different, um, you would need to go to that, um, that list and say, um, you know, look, we're evolving the business in this direction. Um, click here if you're interested to know more. OK, so I've just got one more slide on consent and then I'll look at questions because I know this is a key area um, and is what gets people um, unduly anxious, in my view. OK, it's it's reasonably straightforward. Just remember, you've got to be transparent. You've got to be upfront about telling people what you're going to do with their data. Then you need just really clear evidence of their consent. It needs to be they need to be able to withdraw that consent. That makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if they're not liking what they're getting, they've got to be able to withdraw their consent. And, and obviously, it's got to be as easy, easy as possible to withdraw that consent. OK. Right. The final slide on consent. What has changed is that there is now a definite onus of proof on us as data controllers, as, as business owners that are processing the data. The onus of proof is on us to demonstrate consent. If that's the legal ground that we're relying on to process data, then we have got to be able to prove that. Um, we've got to keep records to demonstrate what the individuals consented to, uh, including what they were told in privacy notices or policies existing at the time of consent and when and how they consented. So, I mean, we, before you start panicking and thinking, oh my goodness, I've got to keep, you know, I've not got time to keep all these records. Chances are that if you're getting people to opt in uh, to a freebie, you've linked it up to your email service provider and that they are, um, that consent is somehow tracked 
within that email service provider. I use Infusionsoft, so I can only talk about that. But certainly, I, I take great pleasure when people send me, in fact, I got one the other day, um, she said, fuck off about GDPR, with, with the exact uh, very pleasant words that the lady um, wrote to me. I don't know who you are and why you're emailing me. Um, and I took great pleasure in um, reminding her that not that long ago, she'd signed up for one of my freebies and that my privacy policy had been very clear um, that I would be emailing her about other things that I thought might interest her, which of course is, is compliant now um, um, under, under the existing rules. Um, she, she didn't reply. So, um, yeah, I think she took that on board. Um, but, but we, you know, chances are that we already have that, um, those records there. So in Infusionsoft, you know, I went into her record um, in the CRM. It clearly shows me what email, you know, where the consent came from, because it tells me that she filled in, in the form on such a date. Um, and I know that there's a, there was a privacy policy link in that opt-in box. Um, and, you know, it gives me all of the information that I need to, to prove consent. So just have a think about how you are obtaining that data um, and how you are recording the consent of the individual. Now, just a few things on children, for those of you who deal with children very quickly. You need parental consent for children. Well, actually, the Act says children under 16. Um, I believe the Data Protection Bill, which is how we're going to implement this in the UK, um, makes it 13. OK, so I'm pretty sure that's the case. But so parental consent for children under 13 signing up to services requested and delivered over the Internet other than for preventive or counselling services. And you need to implement age verification measures and make reasonable efforts to verify parental responsibility. Um, and you will need to obtain the consent of the actual child when they reach. It says 16 there, but it would be 13 under the, um, the data protection bill that's being implemented in the UK. Okay, so if you have got issues with children, if, you, if you've got, um, say, for example, internet services that are being delivered to children, just, just flag that this is a slightly separate issue. If you've got any questions on that, please do ask me in the Facebook group. And if there's enough of you that need to know that, I'll do a little video for you. Okay, phew, I'm going to need to take a big sip of my tea and have a quick scan down the question box. And I'm overwhelmed, Christine, I was, I, was, I was saying, you know, don't feel overwhelmed. I am overwhelmed by the number of questions, which is brilliant, you know, that you're, that you're asking so many questions. And I normally do a legal webinar and we're looking if we have like two questions. So um, uh, you know, this is great that you're so interested, but equally it makes it quite difficult to um, assimilate quickly and reply. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose some just out of the mix. And um, as I say, if I haven't answered your specific question, please do pop it in the Facebook group. Uh, so V says, my newsletters uh, usually include both news articles, non-selling and occasional offers or upsells to my services. I don't have them separate. Surely the intention isn't to create more work for us by administering two different types of lists when the newsletter includes a bit of both. Yes, V, I'm sure the ICA would not want you to go as far as to have one newsletter for articles and one newsletter for offers. So you just need to be, I mean, it's just it's being sensible about it. You know, how can you be transparent? OK, so in it, you say, please tick here if you would like my newsletter that will give you some really valuable articles about X. And I'll also include some great offers from time to time. You know, that's what we're talking about. It's that kind of, of sense check. And um, just being really upfront with people about what you're doing with it. You know, if you're delivering the value, people aren't going to be bothered about you giving them a great offer, you know. Um, but yeah, by the strict letter of the law, just be clear and tell them exactly what you're going to be um, using, using it. OK, let me have another. Um, Penny says, how do you know if they're children? We're not we do not age collect, collect age as we don't need it for processing. Uh, yeah, so I think if you if it's services designed for children, then um, you know then that is um, obviously something to think about. Um, you know, if it's uh, I don't know if a um, this, you know does it specifically says so signing up to services requested and delivered over the internet. So this is really getting to the kind of mobile apps and the games and things like that. That's what this is designed for. So if you get a child signing up for your email newsletter about internet marketing. Um, you know, then then you're okay. Um, 
Lindsay says, would this be sufficient to gain consent from a current list? If you want to withdraw your consent, please click the unsubscribe button in this email. Um, I, I, uh, I wouldn't advise that. Um, it, it doesn't do anything. Uh, you know, I, if I got that, I would unsubscribe purely out of principle for getting that email. Um, I'd really recommend that you watch the marketing piece that we do in the group about how you do it in a really positive way that is going to encourage your subscribers to be interested and to um, stay with you rather than unsubscribe. Um, I, it, the email that you, I suggested that you send to your list uh, to opt, re-opt in and the information that you need to put in there will be included in my GDPR pack. So I'll tell you about that at the end. Louise says, struggling to see why this is better for the data subject than double opt-in, where people are asked if they are interested and then that interest is double checked. Double opt-in still is an example, Louise. Um, so a lot of people are confused about that and think that GDPR um, requires a double opt-in. It doesn't, okay? But double opt-in is absolutely affirmative, um, yeah, evidence of affirmative consent, affirm affirmative action and consent. So if you've been doing the double opt-ins, then great. Um, that's certainly one tick, one box ticked in terms of uh, GDPR com compliance for consent purposes. Okay, all right, there's too many questions for me to scan down at this point, so I'm gonna have to move on, I'm conscious of time. Okay, so legitimate interests, not as long on this as um, consent, but I do want to flag it because, as I say, marketers got very excited about it um, because Recital 47 says that the processing of personal data for direct marketing purposes may be regarded as carried out for a legitimate interest. And marketers thought, yippee, this means we don't need to get consent. We can rely on legitimate interests as a ground for processing instead. Well, I'm afraid, of course, it's not quite that simple. Um, so let's talk about legitimate interests. There must be a relevant and appropriate relationship. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, if somebody is an existing customer and you, um, you, you know about them, you know their needs and benefits, and you email them about something that would be a natural um, bolt on to what they've already got, for example, then that is something that would point towards legitimate interests. It's not definitive of it, it's not that if somebody's a customer, you can email them willy nilly, but it's absolutely pointing in the right direction for it to be um, a legitimate ground under the legitimate interest heading. The next point is, is that you need to assess whether the individual would reasonably expect their data to be processed in the way that you're doing at the time that you're doing it. OK, so again, it's you know following on from the relevant and appropriate relationship. Would it be in that say we're talking about the customer again? Would it be in that customer's expectation um, for you to tell them about something that could enhance their service? Arguably, it would be. Does it balance between the company's interests, so you, your, your interests as a data controller, and the rights of the individual? And again, you know, it will depend on, you know, is it sensitive data? Um, is it processing on a large scale? Uh, is it, you know, in fact, where is my little list? I'll pop this. I think I've already done a video on this and it's in the group. If I haven't, I'll pop it, pop the list in the, in the Facebook group. But there is a, um, a number of things that, that you should consider in balancing those interests between, uh, between you and the rights of the individual. Now, as I said before, if you fail to gain consent, you can't fall back on, on a claim of legitimate interest. Um, so you have to be, um, you know, you have to be pretty sure that, that, um, um, legitimate interest is is the right uh, ground to rely on. Um, it's likely to be most appropriate where you use people's data in ways that they would reasonably expect and which have a minimal privacy impact or where there is a compelling justification for the processing. So that kind of summarizes what I'm saying about them reasonably expecting their data to be processed in that way and this balance um, between the company's interests and the rights of the individual. Next point there is the processing must be necessary. If you can reasonably achieve the result, the same result in another less intrusive way, then legitimate interest won't apply. So let me think of an example of that. Um, so say, um, uh, 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 trying to think on the top of my head. Um, 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 
what would we do that's that's intrusive? No, nothing is coming to mind, people. My my brain is is slowing down now after an hour and twenty minutes, forty sorry, hour and forty minutes of talking. I'll post some examples. Um, I have done this on another more specific training on legitimate interests. Um, so I will post some examples in, in the Facebook group because I know that I'd like to give you some examples here. Let me see if I've copied any into my notes here. No, I haven't. OK, so forgive me for that, guys. I will post them in the group um, because I know that it's, it's hard to think in the abstract about what this might be. Um, so I will do that. I'll give you some really solid examples of legitimate consent. I have got it here in my notes, but I don't want to waste time looking for those. Okay, so the main thing for you to understand is that if you see people in, in very well-meaning groups online that are saying, hey, marketers, don't worry, we don't need consent for diet marketing because of this legitimate interest thing, just think that is not, you know, it's not the case, okay? It's, there's, you've got to fulfill these other tests. Now, there is um, one of the things in my pack, the GDPR pack, is a legitimate interest assessment form that walks you through the types of things that you need to think about before you can say that it is legitimate interest as a ground for processing. Okay, good. Right, let's see if there's any questions about that. Brent says, if someone buys something, is it legit? Mm. Okay, so that's probably under the legal grounds of, of contractual. Um, so if, um, if somebody, uh, buy something and then you deliver it, then obviously that's the contractual ground. If, if you're saying, are you okay to market to them? Is it legitimate interest? Then yeah, I mean, as I say, if, if it's a customer and they would reasonably expect you to be telling them, um, about a way that they can improve their product that they've just bought, or if it's actually, here's, here's an example. So say you, you, um, uh, somebody's bought a, um, a product and you've decided that you want to enhance the guarantee that you've given them. Okay, obviously that is legitimate interest because they would, they would reasonably expect you to get in touch with them to say actually your guarantee is being extended um, and that um, it's not you know, jeopardizing their data in any way, um, et cetera. You don't need to get their consent to, to be able to do that. Now you've probably already got their consent for other things like you know, sending them marketing emails and stuff like that. Equally, and on the other side, if there was, um, you know, maybe you'd sold things and there was a product recall, then obviously you wouldn't need consent for that as a ground. That would be legitimate interests, um, things like that. Now, there are there are some things where th th those um, examples were to the benefit of the data subject. There are still examples where it's not to the benefit of the data subject. It's to the your benefit. It's your legitimate interests. The key part is balancing your interests against the data subjects interests and making sure that um, you uh, you know you you look after the data subjects interests so if you can achieve the same result in another less intrusive way then you do that you've got to be you know yes i think this is designed not to stop you as a company doing what you want to do but you've got to have an eye to um, the interests of the data subject is effectively what it's what it's saying okay I'm going to do a separate video about examples of legitimate interests in the Facebook group. OK, so if that's an area that interests you, then have a look out for that. OK. All right. Moving on to accountability and you'll be pleased to know we're nearly there with the content. I have been answering questions as we've been going through, but I would like to definitely have a piece at the end for questions. So accountability. And I'm going to go through the next few slides fairly quickly, just to give you a really high level view of what you need to think about. If you need more information, come back to the Facebook group and I'll do separate videos on that. OK. So the data protection um, notifications, people, a lot of people have said to me, uh, do we still need to pay the £35 fee to the ICO? Um, the answer is no, you don't. That is what, so ac internal accountability is replacing that. Okay, however, that is not the end of the story because what they are now proposing to introduce, it was in a statutory instrument laid in front of, I think the House of Lords a few days ago, they are proposing to uh, put in this controller charge. Okay, and if you're processing data and you don't fall uh, within the exempt categories, 
then the fees range from £40 at the lowest level up to £2,900 at the higher level. Okay, now I've done a separate video on this um, with the um, all the criteria in a comment to that video. So go and have a look at that to see whether you are likely to need to pay the controller charge. Okay. Um, as I've already mentioned, you've got obligations to maintain internal records of processing and policies and measures that demonstrate effective compliance. Now, as a small business owner, the onus on you to do that is vastly different to that of a multinational. OK, so please, again, don't lose sleep over this. Just to, I'll tell you at the end of you know, in a couple of slides time, I'm just going to give you some really simple set steps that you need to take now. OK, so don't worry about it. Um, you need to designate someone as having responsibility for data protection compliance. And if you um, are a certain type of organization, then you'll need to appoint a specific data protection officer. And there are lots of rules about who that person can be, what their job, job function needs to be, etc. And I've done a separate video on that in the Facebook group. So if um, uh, in, in summary, if you've got over 250 employees, then you will need one full stop. It used to be as simple if, as if you, um, I think the draft um, GDPR said if you had less than 250 employees, you didn't have to um, appoint a data protection officer, but now it's not quite so simple. They've put in um, some other criteria. So do go and have a look at that in the Facebook group to see whether you need a DPO or not. Okay, um, you need to organize an information audit. Um, I'm gonna come on to that in a minute in the, in the, um, the steps that you need to take actually, but just acknowledge information audit in terms of working out what data you already hold. Uh, you need to put policies and procedures in place to ensure the accuracy of the information, as I've already said, and um, maintain records of activities related to higher risk processing. Um, so if you're processing sensitive data or it's processing on a large scale, it's maybe behavioral, uh, monitoring behavioral activities, things like that then the separate rules on that. And again, I'll do a separate video on that in the Facebook group. And if you do have staff, you need to organize suitable training for the staff to bring them up to speed with what's going on with GDPR. Okay, um, rights of data subjects. Now these um, have been enhanced significantly with GDPR. Um, so this is where a um, someone who you're collecting data on um, wants you to do something with that data. So hopefully you should all be familiar with um, data subject uh, access requests where people can write to you and say, hey, what data have you got on me? Um, now, previously you were able to charge £10 to reply to those subject access requests. Now you have to do it free of charge unless it's manifestly unfounded or excessive. Okay, now has anyone ever had a data access request, uh, pop it in the chat box if you have. I think they're, you know, they're relatively, for, for this sort of micro business size, um, I think they are relatively um, uncommon. I think, you know, for, for larger businesses, they are getting increasingly common as, as individuals become more savvy about their rights. And, and they are particularly common in the realm of employment disputes where employees will will go on you know pretty much a fishing expedition to try and find things that will um, improve their case but you need to be aware just in case you do get one you need to be aware that it's not something to be ignored it's not something to be a uh, thing oh i'll deal with that next month uh, because you must reply within a month okay if there's two things that you take away from this in terms of the rights of data enhanced rights of data subjects you need to, if you get a data subject request in, which is someone saying, look, you know, I'm, I just wanna know what data you hold on me. Um, then, you know, think you need, to, you need to do something with it and you need to act quickly, okay? Um, unless the request and the data is complex, then you can have a further two months uh, to respond. But typically you've got to reply within a month and you've got to do it free of charge unless it's manifestly unfounded or excessive. Um, I'll do a separate video on the rights of data subjects um, included in the pack for those of you who do employ people and for those of you who there is a chance that you would get this. There is a, a template on um, certainly for employees on how to make a, an employee subject access request and how to respond to a subject access request because again, GDPR specifies certain things that you need to include in that response. Um, but just, you know, for the vast majority of you on this training, I suspect if you just have a red flag in your head that if somebody asks you, what data do you hold on me? 
then take it seriously. Uh, you've got to act quickly and you can't charge anymore. OK, they're the key things I want you to take away from this. Um, there's other rights of rectification and erasure, uh, which, as you might think, is all about, um, you know, if they realise that you've got incorrect data on them, then um, you've got to correct it and, and to erase them completely if that's what they want. There's a right to data portability, um, which is relatively complex. I'm not going to spend much time on that. There's, there's, er there's, there's certain areas where it applies and where it doesn't. Um, right to object to profiling. I suspect none of you on this call are doing any profiling, but um, again, if that's an area of interest, let me know and I'll do a video on it. Um, and there is this, as we've already talked about, this right to object at any time to processing data for direct marketing purposes, uh, which must be explicitly offered in an intelligible manner and say that it's clearly distinguishable from other information. Um, and they've got the right to lodge a complaint with the supervisory authority. So all you need to know is data subject rights have been enhanced. Really, the, the most common one is going to be right of subject access request. Um, it's got to be complied with free of charge and it must be actioned within a month generally. OK, so right, right, wrapping up, wrapping, can't even speak now, wrapping up before we come to some questions. Um, your obligations, you've obviously got to comply with the data protection principles that we talked about right at the start. Those were the ones, if you remember, that overlaid that um, sales and marketing life cycle diagram. OK, so that's an ongoing obligation. Um, maintain a record of processing operations. Now, as I said, I, I think I said I've done a separate video on that because there are certain categories of businesses that don't have to keep records and there are those that do. Um, so please do go and find that video. Um, you need to implement measures to ensure a level of security appropriate to the risks. And as I say, I'll try and get a security expert to come on and do a little interview with me in the group about um, what are the practical steps uh, that we need to take to ensure that. Um, this is this is an important one, actually. Um, if you do have a personal data breach, um, then you must notify the ICO within 72 hours of that breach. So if you lose any data, um, then, um, in fact, I'll do it. I'll do an expanded video on that because again, it's, it's not quite that black and white. But um, but just have that red flag in your head um, that if there is a, any kind of data breach in terms of loss of data, unauthorized disclosure, etc., you need to notify within seventy two hours. Um, and I'll do a separate video on that. Um, now, this is an interesting one for those. I'm going to do a separate training for people who are outside of the EU. Um, but if you are outside the EU, then you need to appoint a representative within the EU um, for, um, you know, for things like people, uh, data subjects to write to for subject access requests, for example. So I'll do a separate uh, training on that for, the, for those who are interested in that side of things. The, the next point, again, it seems like I'm putting all these points on and saying I'll do a separate training on that and I'll do a separate training on this. I mean... Look, for the, being sensible about this, you know, for the vast majority of you, a lot of this isn't going to apply. I just want to highlight it in case it does. OK, so please don't be panicking and thinking, oh, my goodness, there's so much I need to comply with. OK, really, you know, if you're a small business owner and you're not doing anything dodgy with the data, just be sensible. No, think about the legal ground for processing. Think, what, what are you actually doing with the data? Um, be transparent with people, get consent and that's pretty much, you know, really, as far as you're concerned, that's pretty much it. Um, subject to, um, you know, a few tweaks, which I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you an action plan in, on the next slide. But don't don't sort of get overwhelmed by all this. I'm highlighting it for re as red flags in case it does apply. Chances are for a lot of you, it won't. OK, the next point, only use data processes that guarantee compliance with GDPR and put in place compliant data processing agreements. Now, this is actually a big one. So if you, um, um, let's say, say you've got payroll, for example, payroll is an example of the data processor. They have to guarantee compliance with GDPR and you have to have the right, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice now. You have a swig in my tea. You have to have the right um, processing agreement in place. There will be in the GDPR pack that I'm releasing, there will be a, um, a data processing agreement that is GDPR compliant together with a processing checklist. OK, 
uh, just flag that in your mind. And um, if you do use data processors, if you if if you send the data to anybody to process that data, like payroll providers, like um, who else, like your um, email marketing provi uh, providers, um, etc. Now, with that, um, with people like Mailchimp, for example, um, that are, that is their job. So I'm sure that they are working towards putting in place the terms with you. Hopefully, they're working towards putting in place a compliant data processing agreement there, okay? But in the checklist that I'm going to give you in my pack, um, that will give you a tick box of things that you can check. Um, and I'm sure people in the group will share at some point whether, you know, if they do the exercise themselves, they'll say, okay, look, it's cool. I've been through this thing. MailChimp's compliant, okay? Um, and, you know, on just ongoing, when you're planning um, new phase, new new products and services, then ensure that data protection principles and appropriate safeguards are addressed and implemented. Phew. Okay, that is a whistle stop tour um, of GDPR. Here is your action plan, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, this is really super simple. So if you're feeling a little bit like your brain is, is um, about to explode, uh, please don't. It is simple. I know I've given you a lot of information. That's because there's a lot of contingencies and possibilities, but chances are you only need to know the basics, which I hope I've made clear. So your action plan. Okay, what I want you to do in the in the near future is an audit, okay, a data inventory. Go and look at all the personal data that you hold, where it came from, and who you share it with. Okay, so you do a spreadsheet and you put a column down the left hand side um, that says, okay, well, I've got my email list. Where did that come from? Okay, well, it came from this opt-in and this opt-in and this opt-in. And who did I share it with? Well, hopefully no one, because that'd be easier. But if you did share it with somebody, you need to write that down. Um, the next step is review and document the le legal basis for all of the processing. So on, on that list, actually, you, you might have your email marketing stuff, you'll have your payroll stuff if you employ people, etc. So the legal basis for processing um, with your, most of your email marketing stuff, it's probably going to be consent. Now think about whether that consent is GDPR compliant. Chances are it's not. You're going to have to go and get fresh consent. Um, is it um, to comply with the contract if you've got data on like customer details? Um, is that ground of processing contractual? then mark that down next to that data that you store. Okay, now in my GDPR pack, I have a template for you of exactly how to do this. Okay, that will walk you through that. The next step is to review your privacy notices and amend where necessary. I would say I expect every single person will need to amend their privacy notice. Make sure that you get a compliant privacy notice from a trusted source. Don't try and knock one together yourself um, or copy them. You can get that in my pack. Um, the next step is email your list and ask for a GDPR compliant consent. And please do make that if you can as part of it. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm have to have some more water. Mm -mm -mm. Please do listen to the video that we're going to do in the group on how to do a re engagement campaign um, and ask for, for fresh consent as part of that re engagement campaign. Um, the email, the template email that I would recommend that you send to your list is in the GDPR pack. And then the next uh, thing is to put systems in place to be able to keep records of consents. Chances are you already have that in the software that you're using, but look into um, how that is being done. And that's it. You know, if, if all you take away from this um, this webinar, this training is, is these simple steps, that's a really good start. And I tell you, if the ICO come knocking on your door, you can say, well, I did this two hour training on it and I'm starting to audit my personal data and I've looked at the legal basis for the processing and I've amended my privacy notice and I've got fresh consent, you know, they're going to be happy with that. So um, this is a solid, simple action plan for you to be working towards GDPR compliance. Now, da -da -da, thank you so much for being so engaged and asking so many questions. We'll come on to um, a little question section in a minute, but before we do, so many of you have already been asking me about my GDPR pack. Um, if you're already a member of my Small Business Legal Academy, it is included. I'm going to be adding it um, without additional charge. You'll be very happy to know. Um, and um, for those who aren't members of my Legal Academy, why, a, a, why not? Because it's amazing and every member that we've surveyed would recommend it. 
Um, it gives you template documents and video guides and checklists on pretty much every area of law that you need to consider as a small business owner, not just GDPR. Um, but for those of you who aren't, I am putting together a standalone GDPR pack um, for you to purchase. And this includes everything that I think is going to be um, relevant to you as a small business owner, an online business owner, to help you to be GDPR compliant. So all of the things that I've talked about are in there and a lot more, as you can see. Now, don't look at the list and think, oh, my God, I've got to put into place 20 documents. Chances are you don't. OK, because chances are that you, you know, if you don't have employees, then that's five documents out. Um, the data breach record, you literally just print that off and have that there or just know that you've got access to it if you need it. Um, same with the um, DPIA form. Um, let's see. So what have we got on here? We've got, I mean, the, the, the main thing is we've got your email for refresh and consent and your new privacy policy. And the reason that this says week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, to keep my sanity, um, I'm releasing these documents on a phase basis. So I, I'm actually going to be you know, personally crafting them um, myself and making sure that they're absolutely compliant. And not just that, anyone who's a member of my Small Business Legal Academy will know that I make things super simple. Okay, so I'm not about legal jargon. I'm not about complicated, very lengthy um, legal paragraphs. I'm about simple to the point, clear, okay, um, and in a commercially um, practical way. Um, so I'm going to be putting them together myself and I'm going to be releasing them on a timed basis, uh, as I say, because otherwise I'll um, go a little bit insane. So, but I'm going to be giving you the things that you need in the order that you need them. So, for example, week one, you're going to be getting the email for refreshing consent and your privacy policy. OK, so if you've done the exercise of um, if you know that you need to get that fresh consent, um, and you want to start doing that because maybe you've got a launch coming up or something like that, then I'm giving you the, the compliant privacy policy um, so that you can use that with that launch. Um, week two is the data processing inventory that I talked about, a legitimate interest assessment form, a data transfer checklist, et cetera, et cetera. So all the things that I know are going to be really helpful to you um, are in the GDPR pack. Now, you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, yeah, it's all right for Suzanne to say, um, you know, it's going to cost a fortune. I haven't got, you know, I'm a small business owner. I haven't got any money. Um, I'm just going to take a, I'm going to take a, a chance on it. No one's going to report me. Nobody's going to investigate me. Um, I'm just going to cobble it together myself. OK, please don't, because I'm doing it for £97. OK, um, so this is an introductory price um, because I'm doing it in a timed release. Um, it is £97. That price will be increasing. Don't know when, but it will be. Um, but at the moment, I just want to help as many people feel that they are in safe hands with putting the documents and the policies in place that they need to. So if you follow those simple steps, let me just go back to this slide here. Follow these simple steps and use the documents that are in the GDPR pack. That's going to save you a lot of searching around on the Internet, of getting confused by conflicting articles, of losing sleep at night and wondering if you're going to get fined 20 million pounds, which I've already told you you're not. Um, a very small price to pay uh, to be able to um, make sure that you are working towards compliance. Not to mention, of course, you've got all the free um, guidance that I'm giving in the group. But this is the this is the documents that you need. It's the checklist. It's the templates. It's the etc. OK, so um, I would love you just to try that link for me. And let me know if it works, because, again, we had a little bit of a technical uh, technical problem with that link. Uh, so if somebody could actually check that for me, that would be awesome. Um, oh, no, Joanne's saying she recently paid £300 um, for, for a similar pack. Oh, dear me. Well, yeah, I've, I've consciously gone. I, I, I know the prices that other people are charging, and um, and I just wanted to make it super affordable. Um, for people who get in at the start of this, um, because um, I know that I know the challenges, you know, running running a small business, it's um, it, it's it's hard. Uh, so good. So that's nine seven pounds. I say it's an introductory price. Um, so grab it while it's there, folks. Um, it will be going up. Um, thank you for confirming that the the link works. There's lots of questions about my legal academy. Um, so my legal academy. Uh, which not just contains the template documents, the um, 
uh, the checklists, the uh, video guides and everything else. It, it's also actually an eight week program uh, that walks you through all the kinds of issues that you as a small business owner are likely to need to think about. So for example, week one is all about protecting your brand. Uh, week two is about limiting your liability. Week three is about getting paid. Week four is about dealing with suppliers. Week five is about um, marketing regulations and data protection. Week six is social media and something else that I can't remember right now. Week seven is all about working with freelancers. Uh, week eight is about recruiting, taking on and um, managing employees and employee legislation. So a really comprehensive pack um, as, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, which, which, but that's what, not what I'm here to, I'm talking about the, the GDPR pack today. Um, the Small Business Legal Academy is £697. Um, we do have an offer on that at the moment for 50% off. Um, which brings it down to £348.50 uh, for 12 months membership and then you renew at £97 a year. If anyone is interested in that, then pop a comment in the Facebook group. So not the comments here, but the Facebook group and I'll send you a link to the uh, Legal Academy because that does include the GDPR pack, but you get so much more. So let me know if you're interested in that and I will post that in the Facebook group. Um, Imogen saying just purchased. Thank you. Works fine. Fantastic. Um, good. Oh, thanks, Andy, for popping in the redirect there. That's great. Um, Andy says, does the pack include questions specific to our business straight, making sure it works for us? Um, it is just a templated version, Andy, as you'd expect for that price. Um, but I do obviously give a lot of free advice in the Facebook group. Um, I can't answer every individual question, but if I think that there is enough um, you know, I, I will talk around areas of interest, but no, if you wanted to be able to come to me and set and run me through a specific scenario for your business, then there's two options. Either you take me on as a bespoke lawyer and I charge you an hourly rate, or if you want to be an elite member of my small business legal academy, that has a Facebook group where I will answer specific questions. Okay. Um, do, do, do. Let me see what else there is. Um, Michelle says, I think I signed up for the Academy. <laughs> is that what starts with the eight week videos? Yes, it is. Lindsay's saying, how do you join the Academy? Okay, well, I'll post a link to the Academy in the um, the Facebook group. Um, but really here I'm talking about the pack. Penny says, I noticed no checklists there. Will you be able to market to those who buy? <laughs> Penny, yeah, you are on the ball, Penny. No, well, here's my plan. Here's my cunning plan, okay? so. Um, when you um, also bearing in mind, of course, that we are not yet at the point of needing to be uh, GDPR compliant, and I will be going out to my list in the near future to do a consent refresh. Um, but yeah, no, absolutely. I, I will be um, asking for, I'll be being, being very granular with my consent requirements, Penny, at some point in the future. Uh, thank you for flagging that. Um, Andrew's saying, trying to post in the GDPR Facebook group, but can't do that for some reason. Please do post that link. OK, we will do. You should be able to post in that group. So I'll find out why that is. Um, see what else people are asking. What's the best way to contact you to discuss GDPR compliance for my specific business? If you email me at support at suzannedibble.com, that's the best way. Support at suzannedibble.com. Uh, OK. Lorna says, I'm a sole trader with no employees. How relevant or necessary is the GDPR pack you're going to mention? OK, yep. If, if you are processing personal data, Lorna, it's very relevant. Um, for anybody who processes personal data of people in the EU, it's very relevant. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions about that. Uh, it, <laughs> it looks like a Facebook book that Andrew can't post in the group, possibly. We've had a brilliant engagement in that group. I can't keep up with the number of requests. We've gone from zero, zero to nearly 2,000 in less than a week, <coughs> which is fantastic. Um, Helen says, can the privacy pack be used for any small business? I have an online shop and a tutoring online and offline. Yes, yes, Helen, it can. Um... Oh, Julia says Facebook and Instagram are being glitchy. It's not you. Okay, thanks for that. Um, 
Elizabeth says, pure gold for the legal peace of mind from Super Suzanne Dibble. It's a no brainer. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That is very kind of you. Good. Okay. Excellent. Um, Oh, Tracy says seven weeks is a long time to wait for the processor agreement. Any chance of getting that earlier? Yep. If that is something that you you need, um, email me Tracy support at suzannedibble dot com, and we can look at moving that up the list for you. Um, okay. Janelle says join the academy. It's so robust and great value for money. Thank you, Janelle. That's very kind of you to say. Okay, awesome. So folks, go grab your GDPR pack um, because um, it is £97. Um, Cara, no, you can't get a smaller pack. Um, I've literally, if you think that I was going to charge £97 for the privacy policy and then added all the other things as a bonus, that's a good way of thinking about it. Uh, don't sort of, you know, not be compliant because I don't think you're going to see a better, better value pack. Uh, so don't not be compliant because you think there's lots of documents in there that you won't need. Uh, probably not the right way to think about it. Okay, so let me scroll back now. I know we're a little bit over time, but I'm happy to stay on as long as um, you guys need me, uh, subject to my voice holding out. Um, so I'm going to go back over some of your questions. Um, I'll obviously, if you guys need to hop off um, to do whatever you need to do, then that is absolutely fine. Uh, thanks for all your lovely comments about how helpful it's been. Oh, sorry, one last question on the pack. Andrew says, can I use the PAC Stroke Academy for helping my own clients with GDPR compliance? Afraid not, Andrew. Happily point them in my direction. Be happy to discuss an affiliate uh, payment uh, for you. But no, the license for the PAC is purely for your own business. Um, if you want to use it with clients, then I'm happy to do, do some kind of affiliate arrangement. Email me at support at suzannedibble.com and we can talk about that. Um, that applies to all of you. If you have people, you know, a, a wide community that you think would benefit from this, then um, either A, if you're happy to do so just because you think it's awesome, then send them the link to this pack. Um, if you do want, if you've got a big audience and it's worth us setting up an affiliate link for you, um, we're more than happy to do that as well. So fair, do share it far and wide. Good stuff. Oh, Barry, thank you for your comment about me over delivering as always. That's very kind of you. Good. Right. Let me try and scan back through some of these questions. Brent says, can I use it in the Netherlands? Can I direct translate the pack? Mm, mm, mm. Let's have a look. Let's see what's in here. Um, Data processing inventory. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd say most of it is going to, I mean, it's all, it's most of it, I'd say everything in here actually is not um, UK specific, it's GDPR specific. Um, can you translate it? Yeah, yes, you can. If you have a translation service that you trust, feel free. Feel free. Okay, so Lindsay says she's been a web designer for eight years. It's my responsibility to ensure old and current clients are GDPR compliant on their websites. Um, I'm not sure. So is it your duty to ensure that old and current clients are GDPR compliant? Um, no, no, Lindsay, it's not. Um, by all means, do tell them about it. Point them my way. Um, point them to the pack. Um, but no, unless you're um, if you're a processor for them, then there's certain obligations on you as their processor. And um, if that is the case, then watch the video that I'm going to be doing in the uh, in the Facebook group on that. But otherwise, no, it's not your responsibility. But yeah, if you're a web designer or anything like that, then please do tell people about this and um, point them my way and enter the pack. Uh, Muriel says, when is week one uh, coming out? Um, in a week's time, seven days. I'm going to give myself seven days to produce those three documents to make sure that they are perfect for you guys. Now, what I should say, actually, with this pack is that the guidance, <laughs> the guidance is still changing, uh, which is why I've been reluctant to put a pack together sooner. Um, but what I will say is that if the guidance does change and it impacts on these documents, then I will obviously be updating them um, and and releasing those to you free of charge. Um, so you'll be assured that they these are all compliant documents. Uh, Claire says, do I need a GDPR pol privacy policy? Ooh, something, wantsy. I don't understand that. 
or my website when I only deal with names and addresses via a contract basis purely for delivery. Yep, if you're only, if you're only processing Claire for contractual purposes and you're not marketing to them or doing anything else with it, then um, then you are, you know, that you're fine. That's that's the basis um, that you're dealing with with them on. Um, let's see what else. Uh, 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 this, um, da, 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 trying to distinguish between the questions and the comments here. So D says, in the privacy policy, do you have to describe the data which is being processed offline, i.e. all the data which is being collected outside the website and processed outside the website? Um, it's it's really, it, it's just a common sense question, D. You know, people want to know what you're doing with their data. Um, so if you're doing one thing with the data that's being collected online and doing something different with the data that's being collected offline, then tell those people what you're doing with the data if that makes sense. Oh no, Heidi paid a £1,500 for her privacy policy and website terms. Oh, you poor thing. Okay, that is not good news, not good news. Um, I'm guessing, Heidi, that that, was, um, that that is a non GDPR compliant privacy policy, in which case do buy the pack. Um, if it is, then my sympathies. Okay, let me look at the rest of the questions here. Um, do, do, do. So Libby says, do I need to get consent for cookies on my website or will the current implied consent we notice still be acceptable? OK, so this is under review. Um, so the, the laws on cookies are being reviewed. They were hoping to review them in, in line with GDPR. It's not going to be the case going forward. So the answer is watch this space um, uh, because... Um, at the moment, you know, there was with the, with the cookie law, there was the, all this sort of hype about you've got to get all these pop up boxes. And then literally at the 11th hour, the ICO guidance came out that you didn't need to have a pop up box unless you were doing certain things like, you know, being particularly intrusive and, and you know, the sort of um, behavioral monitoring that people like Amazon do, um, you know, that, that, that simply having the link to the cookie policy would suffice. Um, so that is is kind of under review, Libby. Uh, ben asked about the fee to the ICO. Hopefully I've clarified that question, Ben. Um, the £35 fee is going away, but what is coming in is a controller charge. And I've done a video on that in the Facebook group. It ranges from £40 to £2,900. OK, I think the the £40 one is anything up to a turnover of 650000 and less than 10 employees. So if you're under that, it's £40. Otherwise, it's in sort of tiers of um, level of turnover and employees. But check the Facebook group out for that. Do pass Tracy says, do passwords for client systems count as sensitive data? Um, interesting. Not been asked that one before. Um, well, look at the checklist of sensitive data, Tracy, and, um, and does it come under that? Um, so if they have... Um, uh, I don't know, copied out some health data as their password. Let's go back to the definition of uh, sensitive data. Where is it? Where did I put sensitive data? Uh, no. no. Yeah. Okay, so data consisting of racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data, biometric data, or data concerning health or a natural person's sex, life or sexual orientation. Um, if it is that, if those passwords contain that, then it's sensitive data. Uh, Nicola says, we write CVs. I think I can guess which Nicola you are. Hello, Nicola, lovely to see you on here. Uh, we write CVs and have electronic copies going back eight years. If people opt out after our consent email goes out, do we need to delete their CVs as well? Um, so it depends what, um, what you've told them and what, what um, uh, how you've broken down the processing of the data. Uh, so if you have, um, say, say your one of your processing purposes is to write the CV, I would imagine that that is a contractual that will fall under the contractual ground of processing. Okay, um, in which case that's not a consent ground. 
Um, so you would be able to keep that CV for, and I would recommend you kept that for, say, six years, because that's the limitation period for contract claims. Uh, so you need that's why you need to break down the different processing activities and then match them up to the different grounds of processing. Uh, because for that, uh, Nicola, that the, the, the writing of CVs would be, and the processing of data in the writing of the CVs would be contractual ground of processing, not consent. Uh, LinkedIn, yeah, I had lots of questions about LinkedIn. I'm going to do a separate training on that. So thanks for all the questions about LinkedIn and retargeting. I'm going to do a separate session on that. Let me go back to uh, this. Okay. Um, do, do, do. Let's see what else. Helen says, I'm working with students and in order to help them, I have questionnaire and keep records of what we cover in the lessons. This, obvious, this accounts obviously as data. Okay, the question you've got to ask yourself is, is it personal data, Helen? I.e. data that can identify um, a, a living person. Uh, I don't know how long I need to keep this kind of data. Do I need to destroy these records after lessons? Um, I'm sure the answer there is no, Helen, uh, you don't need to. So it's probably, I mean, certainly your what you cover in lessons, I would suspect, isn't personal data um, to the extent that you've, you've marked, you know, maybe like, say, my personal trainer keeps um, details on my health data every time. Um, she hasn't she hasn't asked me to sign a form and I suspect she won't. And will I report her to the ICO and will she get fined? No. Um, under the letter of GDPR, she probably would need me to um, sign something to say that I don't mind her doing that. Um, but no, we're talking about personal data here. Um, don't don't sort of widen the ambit. It's personal. Like, you know, just have a sense check about it. Is it personal data that is if you don't comply with all this stuff, it's going to be detrimental to someone else. That's when you really need to think about it. Uh, Cheryl's a web designer and would be interested in affiliate link for the GDPR pack. Fantastic. Cheryl, if you want to email me at support at suzannedibble.com, that would be super. Okay, now I'm going, uh, I'm trying to see all the questions, but going, uh, then we get interrupted by lots of um, lovely comments about the, the, um, the training. So thank you for that. Uh, let's see if there's any more here. Sharon says, I have seminar lists and email addresses, which I don't currently use for marketing. What happens if I decide to use these email addresses in the future? How do I get their consent? Or can I email them the marketing literature with a consent opt-in at that time? Sharon, so what you need to do is uh, to go to these people before um, the 25th of May and say to them, hi, and, and also question whether you do want to or not. You know, what's going to happen if you go to them and say, hi, you haven't heard from me in 20 years, but I'd love to market to you. What's going to happen? So think kind of logically and, and commercially around that decision, first of all. But if you do, do decide that they're going to love to hear from you, and um, then make sure that before uh, the 25th of May, uh, you email them ideally with the email that template that I'm going to give you in my GDPR pack. Um, you email them and you get them to opt in on a GDPR compliant basis. And with that granular consent that we talked about before that specifies exactly what you're going to do with that data, including the fact that you're going to send them marketing stuff. OK. Nicholas, Nicole says, does Facebook count as an external party? Yep, it does. OK, um, I think I've scrolled down quite far in, in both um, the chat box and the questions, the answers. I think I'm going to leave it there for questions now. Um, if there's anything that I haven't answered, please do post in the Facebook group. And um, hopefully you can all get access to um, the Facebook group. I think somebody posted a link to that earlier in the webinar. So uh, do uh, do come and join that. Um, Barry, this is a disaster. Uh, he's struggling to order. Tried three times. Oh, my word. Well, I can only assume, Barry, that the servers are being overcome by the amount of people on this webinar who are trying to order it and um, and it's not actually happening. So please do try um, in, in sort of five or ten minutes time. If you if it won't work, email me um, and we'll, we will sort that out for you. If you email support at suzannedibble.com, uh, we will email, we will sort that all out for you. 
Um, Andy's interested in the affiliate plan, super. Uh, support at suzannedibble.com for that. And Eugenie too, brilliant. Sherry says, is the GDPR pack something we can keep to refer back to or is there a time limit to work through everything? No, absolutely. I mean, this, that's just when I'm releasing it. You know, don't think you've got to have it all done and dusted in week seven. No, absolutely not. I mean, the key thing really is if you need to go out and get fresh consent, make sure you do it before the 25th of May. That's the key thing. Make sure. So the two key things there really are refreshing your consent and the privacy policy. Um, and as part of that, really, you're going to have to look at the data processing inventory and your legal grounds for processing. Um, so the COD probably like week one and week two are the, are the things that everybody will need. Um, things like your data breach record and, and the things in week seven, they're just you know templates for you to have to hand in case you should need them going forwards. Uh, so no, don't think you've got to, <coughs> excuse me, got to sit there for seven weeks and plow through all this. <coughs> excuse me. Okay, fabulous. All right, well, you're all <coughs> entirely fabulous. Thank you uh, for spending two in two hours and 25 minutes with me talking about GDPR. Um, you're all amazing. Thank you so much for your engagement and for your questions. If you've liked what you've heard, please do share the group, the Facebook group, far and wide. Um, please do direct your friends to um, the Facebook group and indeed to the GDPR pack. I look forward to hearing from those of you who want to be affiliates for that pack. The address again, support at suzannedibble.com. Um, obviously, there's going to be more coming out on this. Um, I hope for those of you that are finding it overwhelming, I hope that what I've done today is to show you that these are the, little, the steps that really, if you're not employing anybody um, and you're just thinking about it from a marketing perspective, that these things in the action plan are the things that you need to be thinking about, which is fairly straightforward. Um, for those of you that have more sophisticated businesses, keep an eye on the Facebook group. Um, I go into a lot of a lot more stuff in a lot more detail in there. Um, but obviously, I don't want to bamboozle everyone with everything because a lot of it isn't relevant for everybody. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you so, so much. You're all awesome. And um, yeah, share, share and share. Let's let's get this message out to the, um, the small business community that it, it doesn't have to be um, overwhelming, that, it, you know, the, the, the hype is not, um, it, it, there shouldn't be a hype, you know, follow a few simple steps, get some, some, a few simple documents in place, and uh, everything will be just fine. Uh, so with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once more. Uh, it's been my absolute pleasure and privilege to be here with you. And now I've just got to work out with this new bit of tech how I actually um, end the webinar. Let's see if I come back onto the camera or not. Uh...